And so guys, once you goes, we bring this on live, we're on YouTube and we can start. All right. Stacy, are we all set on YouTube? Yep, just turned you on live. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and good morning to some that are participating from other time zones and welcome to the IRP's technical conference uh, related to contemporary issues. Today's issues will be focused on energy efficiency and load forecasting. I am Jim Houston, chairman of the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission and welcome you here today. We are certainly living in the most dynamic period of time in resource selection decision making. Just 12 years ago, coal made up close to 95% of the generation mix in Indiana. Last year, that share was at 53%, with natural gas and renewable generation taking place of much of the coal retirements. In the integrated resource planning done by our regulated utilities, utility generation is modeled under future scenarios as they examine the possibilities of various futures in a 20-year planning horizon. Energy efficiency is modeled as a resource and all our utilities must project what load will look like in the future as they plan and project their customers' needs and how they will meet their obligation to serve all customers reliably, safely, and at costs that are just and reasonable. I wanna thank our research policy and planning division for assembling a terrific group of professionals today to tackle today's topics. Let me introduce uh, the members of our team. And when I call your name, if you are on video, please wave to the uh, folks in, uh, that are tuning in. Bob Pauley, who is gonna be helping out with questions and answers throughout. Dale Thomas, Dave Johnston, and last, Brad, Dr. Brad Borum. We have many staff personnel from our energy division online as well. I also wanna recognize and give a shout out to my fellow commissioners who will be tuning in for most, if not all of today's sessions. Uh, Commissioner David Zigner, Commissioner Sarah Freeman, Commissioner Dave Ober, and Commissioner Stephanie Krevda. Dr. Borum and Bob Pauley will be running the show today. Bob Pauley will be assisting throughout. They will be giving you guidance on how and when to ask questions and all program details. Let me conclude by thanking our presenters. First, from the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, we have Natalie Mims Frick and Tom Ekman. Next, we, I wanna thank Eric Miller from AES and Chad Burnett from Indiana and Michigan. And closing out today's program will be Anna Summer from the Energy Futures Group representing the CAC Coalition. These subject matter experts will provide great insight and I know will help make today's contemporary issues forum a terrific success. Again, on behalf of the IURC, thank you for being here and now on with the program. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Borum, who'll get things kicked off. Brad? Good afternoon and good morning to others. Um, I just want to uh, uh, reiterate uh, that all of the presentations should be on our website, um, right at the commission's front page of our website. So if you uh, wanna get the presentations that way, you can. Also, for those of you who uh, uh, were with us last August, I think when we last did this, we had a, uh, uh, the way the questions were asked was you, there's a live chat box that you can type in your questions on the YouTube uh, website there and then we we will get the questions and we should be able to read the questions uh, just so long as you indicate which speaker you're directing the question to if there's any any doubt about that and uh, um, I do want to emphasize that this is uh, the first of three workshops that we'll, we will be doing this summer the next workshop will be uh, June 15th 
And then the uh, third workshop will be August 19th. And a very tentative agenda for the second workshop would be to, uh, to discuss the data needs for energy efficiency potential studies, approaches and analysis needed for creating efficiency supply curves, um, Indiana IOUs test for cost effectiveness in their potential study and capacity expansion models. And uh, so that's one broad topic. And the third workshop, again, a very tentative uh, agenda will be or topic will be to discuss energy efficiency supply curve inputs and their use in the capacity expansion models. So, um, you know, Indiana utilities, IOUs use diverse assumptions and approaches to creating and using efficiency supply curves in their uh, resource planning. So, again, those are very high level topics, and we uh, uh, will be hopefully flushing out those topics a little bit more and then uh, working to. Uh, uh, get speakers to help fill out the uh, the agenda for the those next two workshops. Having said that, oh, what did I say? What did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. I meant August, July 15th and August 19th. So for the again the dates again July 15th and August 19th. So um, I've already made a mistake. What the heck? So let's uh, turn it over to uh, Natalie and Tom here, and um, they have a uh, excellent presentation for us to review. And then uh, um, there should be plenty of time for questions and and at the end of their presentation. But uh, um, don't hesitate to type in your questions, and if there's an appropriate time, then then we will ask those questions while the presentation is ongoing. If if uh, if uh, Natalie and and Tom prefer it to be done that way as well, so just let us know, guys. So both ways are fine. What was that? We can have. Uh, we're happy to take questions while we're doing the presentation as well as at the end. Okay, well, let's uh, turn it over to you guys. Let's see. Uh, you sure. should be able to share your screens. Okay. Let's see. How does that look? Are you seeing like a full slide and not a um, a presenter view? I'm seeing the whole slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks, Brad. Uh, thanks, Chair Houston and other commissioners that are listening in and uh, the rest of the IURC staff for inviting us to speak here. So my name is Natalie Mensfrick. I'm with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Tom Ekman and I are going to be talking about efficiency and load forecasting. And before we get into load forecasting, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview and then hand it over to Tom. But the first question that I want to address is uh, why it's beneficial to model efficiency and other DERs as selectable resources in long term planning. Um, and to do that, I think it's useful to take a step back. So. Broadly speaking, the resource planners problem is a Goldilocks problem. We don't want to have too many resources. We don't want to have too few resources. We want to have just the right amount. Um, and here we're defining resources broadly. Um, it includes energy capacity, system components, um, everything that we need to keep the lights on and the refrigerators running and the system reliable. Um, so it also includes ancillary services and, and risk management and resilience. And to solve this Goldilocks problem, it requires analysis that compares costs and risks of resource options. So this slide has two graphs that illustrate that. The graph on the left has two bars that represent resources that the utility owns um, and that expose the utility to risk. So the blue area at the top of the left bar is the amount of load that's at risk because it might be expensive to serve through market purchases due to volatility. And the green area inside the black border on the bar on the right is the amount of firm contracts or resources that might be purchased for loads that don't appear, um, for example, because the load forecast is too high, um, which would result in the utility having a surplus and no sales to cover it. Um, so it's also a, a risk for load volatility. And then 
In the graph on the right, we have uh, the reserve margin. And as the reserve margin increases, we have an increase in cost. Um, but as we have a decreasing reserve margin, we have an increase in risk due to uh, not being able, potentially not being able to meet needs uh, and needing to curtail or, you know, have brownouts or blackouts. So we're really trying to find that sweet spot that's just in the middle. And that brings us back to why resource planners might want to model efficiency into other DERs as resources. And the answer is to reduce cost and risk. Um, when resources are considered together, you can consider their relative costs and risks to identify the least cost reliable resource portfolio. So today, Tom and I are going to share some ideas about considering efficiency and other DERs as a selectable resource. Um, and we're going to focus on load forecasting. So um, the value, as I just said, is of allowing efficiency to be a selectable resource is that it enables direct competition because all of the resources can be so selected by your capacity expansion model. And it provides the model with more options to choose to find that sweet spot. So as Brad said, we're, we're going to participate in three workshops. There'll be two more that are following up and we'll be discussing the other components of the circle on the right side of my slide, resource potential assessments, capacity expansion modeling, risk and uncertainty analysis. And as I said today, we're going to focus on load forecasting. So the topics that we're going to cover are load forecasting basics and models that are used, and then load and resource risk. Um, and the concepts that we're going to cover, and Tom's going to talk about this in the next section, um, the first is the use of a frozen efficiency load forecast where no additional efficiency is included beyond expected um, and known codes and standards. The second concept is that the load forecast assumptions are consistent with the resource potential assessment to make sure that all of your data is aligned. And then the third is the use of a range forecast to allow resource planners to evaluate the relative risk um, of efficiency compared to other resources. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tom, let's see if I can quit sharing my slides. Let's see. Wonderful. Tom, Tom helps me out there. <laughs> no. So thank you, Natalie. Do a check to see if how's that look? Are we at the last slide Natalie had? That looks good. All right. So we'll go from there. We'll start with the basics of load forecasting, uh, and then we'll introduce. Uh, some concepts specific to dealing with energy efficiency and, and the details of load forecast. But let's start with uh, a long-term load forecast. Uh, there, are lo there are several uses of long-term load forecasting or, and, and other uses in addition to long-term load forecasting. Uh, for long-term planning, the for we look at forecasts that have both uh, energy and capacity forecast as part of an IRP process. Uh, that model the effects of changes in economic conditions, changes in technology, uh, the impact of potential policies on future load growth, and on the load shape. For example, if we see electrification or, uh, electric, uh, or electric vehicles coming online, that might change the overall system load shape. In addition to long-term planning, there are other uses for load forecast. Uh, they include short-term planning, which focuses on really short duration or high fidelity analysis for operation and planning needs, uh, maybe for revenue requirements analysis, for rate cases, uh, for fuel supply projections, and for looking at near-term market purchases. So those, those tend to have a much shorter time frame and higher granularity and probably a lot more certainty because we're dealing with the near-term as opposed to the long-term. And finally, an, another use for load forecast is in policy analysis where we attempt to predict the effects of future policies uh, intended to affect demand, in particular codes and standards, uh, as I said, electrification uh, and potential electrification of transit through uh, electric vehicles. So 
the remaining of uh, today's presentation really focus on long term planning because that's its principal application in IRPs. But we will talk about uh, the use of forecasting for these other other uh, purposes as well. So we'll, we'll deal with the realities of load forecasting first as a, as a uh, prologue to the rest of the presentation. There's no one best model, uh, methodologies and level of detail, data requirements and required expertise depend upon the purpose of the forecast. So one model may not fit all uses. Uh, it may be better for some than others. Uh, so there's no one unique approach to, to modeling uh, load growth going forward that may be suitable for all applications. Secondly, and thirdly, no, nearly all load forecasts require uh, some inf information from the past. Uh, we take the past and try to project it forward. We use the experiences in the past uh, and relationships in the past to use those to, to have those either projected forward or modify those as we expect policies to influence them. And no forecast can be correct, certainly in absolute terms because accuracy can only be determined in hindsight. So we may talk about how accurate a forecast was, but we never talk about how accurate a forecast will be um, because we don't know the future and there's no way to measure whether it's going to be correct in the future. We can only determine that by looking at how well it did in the past. And so largely because the future is unknown and we can't change that fact, you just got to get over it. Uh, with respect to whether a load forecast will be correct. Uh, it's only in hindsight we know that, and as the Eagle said, just quit whining about it and accept that reality. So load forecasts are a key component of IRPs. Um, they're up, up here in the upper right. Uh, a load forecast and a range forecast with no energy efficiency is the baseline in, in uh, uh, contemporary approaches to IRPs. But there are other, many other elements that it connects to. These are the other elements you see in an IRP. You've got resource needs assessment, which relies on the load forecast. You've got demand response potential and energy efficiency potential, both of which rely on the load forecast. You've got generating resource potential, which doesn't necessarily rely on the load forecast, but does relate to that with respect to how and when we need resources and how much we're going to need because the generating resource potential needs to look at how much uh, existing resources are uh, being maybe being retired or re reconfigured and uh, how many resources are available so it in order to answer the question what should we need and when will we build it uh, the load forecast plays a particularly important role it also plays a role in risk analysis simply because you have a range forecast that allows you to determine uh, how uh, susceptible your programs and policies are to changes in potential future conditions that might influence load growth. So all of those feed into the resource portfolio and an action plan that might emanate from that. And of course, the description that you have in the in the analysis with respect to underlying assumptions for the load forecast. So we're going to focus on the load forecast, but it is interconnected to the remainder uh, of the IRP. So let's start with a, a general concept of analytical process flows and then see how the load forecast relates to these other components. So we've got the electricity demand forecast or load forecast. It connects to energy efficiency potential. Uh, it also connects the generating resource potential in respect to need. Uh, it There's a set of key drivers with respect to the load forecast and, risk, and the analysis, which, which include fuel prices, also, electricity market prices, uh, natural gas prices. Uh, these all show up uh, focused in the resource expansion model or capacity expansion model. The, we connect a lot of dots. Uh, the load forecast feeds a range forecast into the capacity expansion model uh, without new energy efficiency and demand response, and perhaps without other DERs that are considered that might impact the, lo the load growth. But want to be considered as, quote, a supply side option. Uh, we take from the electric load forecast information that feeds into the demand response and energy efficiency potential assessments because they are connected with respect to their baseline assumptions about use and units. Um, those 
that information in the uh, resource potential assessments for demand response and energy efficiency feed in through supply curves, as was talked about earlier, and we'll see that discussed in a, in a later presentation. Those feed into the capacity expansion model. The generating resource information feeds into there. Uh, the data to create the futures that you're going to test that are consistent with the electricity load forecast and with the assessment of, of potential. All go out, create a resource portfolio that management reviews, looks at risk and alternative cost, decides which kind of portfolio it is preferred and adopts an action plan accordingly to that portfolio. So all of those components uh, start with up in the upper left, the load forecast. Uh, and Stakeholder engagement incurs, occurs through all, the, all this process, including in the development of the baseline conditions for the load forecast, because the, the greater the stakeholder engagement in that process, the more acceptance of the outcome if they have their point of view reflected. So let's look, talk about the first concept that Natalie said we were gonna deal with of the three. It's called the frozen efficiency forecast or, or the non-dynamic forecast in some people's words. It's a tech, it represents the technical efficiency choices that are kept current uh, at current levels in the low forecast, but existing or expected efficiency standards are included. So it's used in the capacity expansion model to prevent double counting. Yet that's its principal purpose. Of it. So it so efficiency savings, demand response potential are not in future uh, the efficiency savings are not included in the load forecast. We're treating energy efficiency and demand response as quote, supply side options. And therefore you don't want them in the load forecast because you would end up double counting both what happened in response to the prices perhaps, or from policies and the estimate of efficiency potential that remains. So this allows efficiency potential all to be traded on the supply side, treated as a supply side resource without, uh, in, in the capacity expansion model without fear of double counting. You've, you've eliminated the overlap between the potential assessment and what's included in the load forecast. In addition, when efficiency is selected as a, or used as a selectable resource, it's not included in the load forecast because you want the baseline conditions to reflect in the potential assessment and the load forecast to reflect the same level of efficiency. So if you've got a refrigerator that is assumed to use uh, 500 kilowatt hours in the baseline, in the load forecast, that's the baseline that is also started for refrigerator efficiency improvements in the potential assessment. And those need to be uh, calibrated with one another, made consistent so that there's no, you're starting from the same point both in the load forecast and in the remaining potential assessment. That avoids double counting of efficiency potential and it allows the, the load forecast to be calibrated with the efficiency potential assessment for purposes of, of uh, downstream analysis. Future efficiency improvements that come um, from either continuation of existing programs or new programs are not also are not included in the low forecast as well. So if you have an ongoing efficiency program, we want to test in an IRP whether that program should be continued. It's no different than determining whether you want to retire an existing generating resource. You want to make sure that the programs you're running today are cost effective to continue. So they have to be removed from the forecast and allowed to compete uh, on a going forward basis. Other remaining efficiency potential, regardless of attribution, is also considered as a resource option. So if you think future codes and standards that haven't been adopted yet are gonna generate certain kinds of savings, those still are on the table. Is there a question? No, nope. all right. Stock turnover also improves efficiency and that is included up to the point where the codes or standards or baseline uh, current practices improve efficiency. So you've got a, a, a non-code compliant existing refrigerator sitting out there in the stock. Uh, that gets removed from the stock because it, the compressor dies and it's taken out of the stock or it's recycled somehow. And a new refrigerator is purchased and, and the current practice or load requirement or, or code requirement, standard requirement for that efficiency is assumed to occur inside the load forecast. So that natural stock turnover will improve, uh, will reduce the, the load growth going forward simply because more efficient equipment is being placed, put in place uh, than was existing in the household or in the business today. So as lighting stock turns over, 
as appliance stock turns over, as motors and pumps turn over, those that are affected by codes and standards get embedded in the load forecast and the load forecast uh, goes down through time. What's not included are the efficiencies above those baseline conditions. Those all show up in the potential assessment and are used to compete in the capacity expansion model downstream. So they're, the, they are separated from the load forecast and, and treated as a competitive resource. So a little bit about codes and standards as a sidebar because it's important. Econometric load forecasting techniques, and I'll talk a little bit more about those when we get into the more detailed discussion, generally fail to fully uh, account for or reflect the impacts of recently adopted codes and standards, particularly if they have, uh, if the frequency and, and magnitude of those changes have been different than have historically occurred in the past. So as an example, let's look at what happened between 1992 and 2016 uh, with respect to federal standards issued by the Department of Energy. If we go from 1992 to 2016, the first phase of that between 1992 and 2008, uh, there was an average of 0.16, 0.6 cents of a standard adopted per year. So two, two standards basically uh, in, uh, three standards in 2001 and four five standards in 1992. That's all that happened over that entire period of time. From 20, 2008 through 2020, 2016, we had five standards a year, more than five standards a year being adopted. So if you used your econometric tools to estimate the relationship between uh, various variables and consumption, including price and household incomes and whatever else, uh, you would, if you use the estimating term uh, between 92 and 2008, you would miss all those impacts. And those impacts adopted between 2008 and 2016 are fairly significant changes. Uh, there'll be echoes uh, of those every six years downstream because that's the regular regulatory update cycle. But all of those impacts wouldn't show up in your historical trends and relationships. So the econometrics would not capture those. They would capture those if they were estimated over the, the eight year period between 2016 uh, between 20, 000, 2008 and 2016, except that those standards were just being implemented, so they have a gradual impact. And so you really don't show the, the magnitude in the long term until those standards have been implemented for multiple years. So again, you miss this uh, in an econometric load forecast. And it's important because these are and have substantial impacts. In the Northwest, we made an estimate of this. Uh, and the regional low growth without those standards pre-existing energy efficiency was about 1.15% uh, in the long-term load forecast. Net of federal standards adopted between 2010 and 2015, that dropped 0.9%. And looking at the standards adopted in 2016 alone that were finalized, it dropped another few tenths of a percent. And that's based on using an end use assessment uh, in the load for forecasting model, where we can specifically identify the impact on individual appliances, lighting, and commercial motors, and pumps, and other other uh, walk-in coolers that all were adopted. So it's a fairly significant impact, and if you miss it, you will overstate uh, load growth going forward. So concept two, back to the main theme. Load forecasts don't stand alone. Uh, they're interconnected to the the potential assessment that I've said before, data flows one direction and back the other. From the efficiency potential assessment to the load forecasting model, uh, we have an analysis of the technical efficiency potential that identifies both technologies and their cost and how much they save or how much they improve efficiency. This is used to develop the efficiency trade-off curves, which I'll talk about more later. So the efficiency choices in the load forecast model are consistent with those in the potentials assessment. And there's a reason for that, which I'll also talk about later. From the end use uh, load forecasting model, not an econometric model because you don't have the, the resolution. Uh, in an end use forecasting model, uh, you can look at specific appliances, specific lighting, and look at their efficiency. The load forecast model provides the numbers of new units, and the efficiency assessment connects back on the other side, providing the, the potential. So what you've got is 
uh, the number of new houses, the number of new appliances, all of those come from the load forecasting model. They are fed into the assessment so that you've got a calibration between the two models. In addition, the fuel uh, choices that are made by the load forecast are influence the number of new, new, new units. So those that econometric relationship that, that determines what fuel choices are being made, how competitive they are for particular end uses, influences the number of units that it also makes it consistent with the potential assessment because the units are derived from that. Connecting the load forecast to efficiency potential, let's go with a couple of examples. In the load forecast model, you provide a forecast of new and replacement buildings uh, and equipment stock that turn over each year. And these units are the ones that, that allow for the estimation of aggregate potential in the potential assessment. So you've got 100,000 new appliances being installed over the course of a 20 year period of a particular nature, that 100,000 number turns to be the number for the baseline for the potential assessment. So those two are internally consistent. A second example is we've got a load forecast includes the efficiency levels of known codes and standards, those that have been adopted and, will, and have a known enforcement date. Uh, and those efficiency levels ser serve as the baseline uh, for the remaining efficiency potential assessment. Now, there's some subtleties there where if, if markets, markets are achieving efficiency levels above codes and standards, you want to reflect that as well. But in both cases, those baselines between the load forecast and the uh, uh, potential assessment are internally consistent. Concept three, the use of a range forecast to reflect uncertainty. So all forecast models depend upon a certain set of economic drivers, which we call independent variables. Some are relatively certain, like population or employment growth or households. The demographics are pretty well set. Uh, in migration, out migration are, are somewhat un unknown, but the basic demographics in terms of birth rates, you know how many people are already here. Uh, within a certain degree, there's less volatility with respect to how, how fast the population might grow in a particular area, how fast employment might grow in a particular area. On the other hand, you have much more uncertainty with respect to kind, certain kinds of variables that also affect uh, load growth, which include fuel prices that, that are reflected in the relative price of electricity and natural gas or fuel oil, weather conditions and technology changes that we see the advent of electric vehicles, the, the penetration of, of solar PV and maybe battery storage. Those are greater, have greater uncertainty surrounding their penetration rate or their impacts as climate change might impact weather. And so as a consequence, uh, those independent variables which might be fed into the load forecast are less certain and may have long wider distributions with respect to their impact on the range. So you can develop this range forecast by looking at, at the distribution of your independent variables and, and coming up with some probability dis distributions with respect to, well, we think this is sort of the normal range of, ec of uh, employment growth, but we might see this low and this high and use that kind of uh, distribution along with the distribution of other variables to generate your range forecast rather than just saying, well, 1%, a half a percent, and two, percent, two tenths of a percent uh, ought to be the range. We think that's a reasonable differential. You can go back to basics and look at what the driving factors are and get a better sense of maybe what the probability distribution of those, that low forecast range might look like. So that, that provides you with some also some insights as to what the major variables are with respect to changing future load growth and allows you to think about potential mitigation strategies in case you're wrong with a particular uh, uh, set, of load, set of load assumptions. All right, so what we have uh, to start out with is a range forecast of energy and capacity without additional efficiency. Uh, in this case, this came from the six power or seven power plant in Northwest uh, published in 2016. Big range, uh, uh, there's a median a quartile and the 90th percentiles uh, covers a pretty significant uh, differential between about uh, 175,000 gigawatt hours a year and up to something approaching 240,000 gigawatt hours a year. That's a pretty good sized range. Uh, and to avoid, uh, avoid any certainty uh, or 
assumptions about what people think is going to be the real forecast, uh, we tend not to refer to any one as a reference case. Uh, that avoids the presumption of greater certainty about the future than you should expect to have and uh, implicitly implying that you know the future more than you do. In addition to uh, the load forecast, one of the inputs to an IRP are the needs assessment, uh, determining whether you've got enough resource to meet your reserve requirements. Historically, this was done on a point forecast basis. You had a high and low forecast and a set of resources and you decided when they intersected and when the, they when you went deficit. Uh, that's now been replaced with, uh, by and large with more uh, probabilistic assessments where you look at a range forecast, these just represent the, the endpoints, a high and low forecast, and the probability of meeting loads, in this case, loss of load probability. Uh, the probability assessments actually fill in an entire range between high and low. You're, you're in, in uh, using a probabilistic resource assessment, instead of picking a high and a low uh, to see when the crossover is, you pick intermediate points and statistically uh, simulate hundreds or thousands of different future conditions with weather, uh, load growth, uh, resource availability, and determine the probability of meeting reserves, uh, meeting your reserve requirements rather than a, a point estimate. So that you have some better sense of, of the likelihood of meeting, uh, meeting reserve requirements, meeting reliability standards, rather than simply a single point estimate that, that could be wildly wrong in either direction. All right. So. We'll turn now from the basics to uh, some low discussions of load forecasting models. I leaned on a former colleague of mine, Terry Moreland, who worked with me at the council for years uh, and was our head forecaster there. So he's provided uh, some insights and helped me learn a little bit more about load forecasting models than I otherwise would have known uh, over the last 25 or 30 years. So, uh, there are multiple models that are used in load forecasting and an IRP. Uh, we'll focus on the load forecasting models. Uh, I won't talk about the, the capacity expansion models and modeling or the resource adequacy models and modeling. Those are coming up probably in uh, ensuing uh, sessions for us. But in load forecasting, we've got uh, basically five kinds of models I'll discuss. There's simple linear extrapolation, what we call trend line forecasting. Uh, there are time series models, which are a little more sophisticated. We look at historical relationships of over, over time. Econometric models, which delve uh, into some fundamental economic relationships, uh, like employment growth and income and household formation. Uh, we have a, a step function different into end use models, which look in detail at end, use, end uses, specifically appliances, lighting, motors, and what have you in much detail. Uh, they have less econometrics associated with them, but we add econometrics back in in hybrid approaches where they are include both econometric and in, and uh, end use modeling type approaches. So let's look at uh, each of those in turn and, and some of their benefits and uh, limitations. Uh, linear, linear extrapolation is pretty most mostly been appropriate when you've got static conditions of in the economy and uh, in energy demand. Uh, and they're pretty good and pro probably appropriate to be used for maybe a year or two. We're just looking at next year's forecast might be used in uh, uh, trend forecasting for revenue requirements because next year is not a lot different other than weather conditions than, than this year. They're easy to implement. They pretty much only rely on past data and uh, a ruler so you can extend the trend line from the past to the future. Uh, they were some sources of pretty significant mistakes in the Northwest in the 60s and 70s, which I'll illustrate to see how bad things could be. Uh, and they're often inappropriate as a consequence for most long-term planning. I'd say all long-term planning. So just uh, to give you an example of how bad it could be, let's take a look. So. Uh, for years, the engineers were in charge of the electric system throughout the country. Uh, economists didn't show up on the scene until the sort of the mid 70s, early 80s. And these, this graph illustrates a load forecast that was done uh, in various years, every five years between 1955 and 1975. 
by engineers. And you can see that uh, while it trends a little bit upward, uh, each 10-year forecast was a straight line. Uh, it was a simple linear extrapolation from the uh, historical growth of the past five or 10 years. And as we move forward in time, uh, in 1980, there was the economist, economist came on scene and produced the first econometric load forecast for Northwest. Energy prices were anticipated to increase because we were moving from the hydro system to a thermal system with much more expensive resources, so prices were going up. And so low forecast got dramatically lower uh, than the engineers had forecast in the past because price response was taken into account. And that's the first time we had an econometric forecast compared to a trend forecast occur. When we look downstream at that, um, prices went up a lot more than were forecast and actual loads uh, were significantly less even than the economist, economist had projected because prices had gone up even more than they anticipated. So elasticity demand being what it was dropped off a lot faster than even they had thought. And there was a major mistake made with respect to overbuilding as a consequence of, of that over forecast. And in uh, five years out, we had missed the load forecast by 32,000 gigawatt hours, which is a fairly significant amount of juice, uh, about 5,000, 5, 1,000 gigawatt plant capabilities uh, were uh, unnecessary uh, and they'd already been started in construction. So uh, that was a major price effect event. So turning back to time series forecasts. Hey, uh, uh, Tom. Yes. This is Brad Borum. Uh, a quick uh, announcement here. It's I think some people are having problems with the uh, uh, the question box on the YouTube. So if, for some people, I think that may be working, and other people it may not be. It seems like we had this problem last year. So I'll give you a couple of options. If if it's not working for you, you send your questions by email directly to me or to Bob Pauley. And my email is B B O R U M. So it's B Borum at U R C dot I N dot G O V. And uh, Bob Pauley's confuse you here, but it's M Pauley P A U L E Y at urc.in.gov. So again, uh, try to use the, you know, the question box or the dialogue box, but uh, apparently that's not working for all. And again, this, I think we had this problem last year. So um, sorry about that, Tom, but if you want to continue. No problem, no problem. I hope, hope the instructions were clear. Um, okay, let's move on to time series forecasts and work through some other ones. Uh, the demand forecast depends primarily on past demand. So it's, again, a short-term forecast view, probably best done when conditions are stable, much like in the trend forecast, and limited changes either in technology or economic conditions are anticipated. It doesn't require much data. It just looks at historical relationship between various uh, time periods and events. Uh, it can address underlying patterns of demand. It basically does a pretty good job of looking at seasonal or monthly and annual demand because it looks at the time, you know, month, month over month changes and year over year changes for the same month. Uh, it doesn't recognize, unfortunately, what might be causing those changes because it's just looking at the trends. So if you have changes in technology like the advent of EVs or changes in codes and standards, it's going to miss those if they haven't occurred in the past. So that's its disadvantage. It's not very predictive of things that you might want to look at for policy analysis. We move now to a much more sophisticated technique and probably the one that's most prevalent across the country are econometric load forecasting models. They're most appropriate for short and medium term forecasts because relationships have to be stable over a certain period of time for them to be uh, consistent. Uh, their particular advantage is they, they're based on economic theory about how various factors, particularly price, affect expected outcome, but they, they connect the dots. They're regression-based relationships that correlate 
conditions in the past to events in the past, like electricity demand and employment or electricity prices or fuel, other fuel prices. They don't have a lot of data requirements. Uh, they have some, but most of that data is publicly available. Uh, they produce measures that fit historical data so you can measure how accurate they were about predicting things in the past if you have the historical data to do that. And that's a, a both an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, they may be appropriate components of a more sophisticated modeling uh, approach. When we talk about hybrids coming up, uh, we'll come back to econometrics. Their disadvantages are they're pretty much unsuited for energy policy analysis because those policies that didn't occur in the past that would have affected uh, that we're talking about, uh, if they if they haven't happened in the past, they're not available to connect the, the dots with respect to relationships. So if you've got future codes and standards or carbon pricing or carbon programs, uh, electrification, if those hadn't occurred in the past, then the ability to, to derive the economic relationships uh, between those variables and those outcomes uh, can't be done. They may not reflect structural changes in the economy, uh, new technologies, Bitcoin mining, electrification policies. If they, again, didn't occur in the past, you can't really talk about those because those changes uh, aren't available in the historical data records. They are uh, having a very tough time uh, ensuring consistency between efficiency potential and assessments because they don't have and use granularity associated with them. Uh, they can, but they typically are done at the much higher level. So you might have three or four parameters representing your entire commercial sector load growth, and those might be household formation, income, uh, weather conditions, uh, and some other variable, uh, a lag variable to represent something else. Uh, it doesn't have any information about how much a refrigerator or a dishwasher or a commercial building uh, lighting system uses. So you can't crosswalk between an efficiency potential assessment and the load forecast. Uh, substantial expertise, again, is required in many of the load forecasts, uh, econometric being one of those, uh, to interpret the results in a reliable way. And use forecasting models are pretty much bookkeeping models. They demand, uh, the energy demand is derived from production of efficiency surfaces where you have the number of units times their efficiency times their utilization and you get the result, that's demand. Uh, it's a pretty simple equation. Uh, they're most appropriate for long-term forecasts and policy analysis, particularly in the residential commercial sectors because we can disaggregate their uses down into multiple specific end uses, their total use into specific end uses and therefore derive a, a pretty detailed look at how those buildings are and consumers are using electricity or for that matter, natural gas. Uh, their principal advantage is that they be, can, can be explicit about energy is used and how stock turnover influences that. Uh, we can evaluate the effects of, of equipment improvement on stock turnover. One refrigerator replacing another one that's more efficient. We can evaluate energy policy choices or fuel policy choices and consistency can check uh, efficiency potential assessments uh, with the load forecast to make sure that they are internally consistent because there's an explicit uh, connection between the two with respect to what units use and how many units there are. They're particularly data intensive with respect to one of its major disadvantages. They, you require a lot of customer survey information, uh, perhaps and probably uh, realistically some, some sub metering information to get a real good handle on how much consumption there is for particular appliances or equipment. Uh, they're expensive to build and operate and maintain because you have to re continually uh, update the consumer information and the appliance stock information and the appliance consumption information. They may or may not be reflective of human behavior responses. Uh, so uh, they might tend to over-optimize if, uh, if it says that the cost performance trade-off curve uh, uh, optimization is done on a simple payback of three years and in fact people don't make those decisions like that so uh, they may overstate what efficiency uh, is actually due and they may over optimize what decisions are being made by consumers when they estimate future load growth. Our last um, 
get, a, get an example of, of how this actually works. You've got electric water heater demand. Uh, there are a number of new homes in this particular case, 20,000 new homes. It's got a baseline efficiency of a 0.9 energy factor, which produces 3,600 kilowatt hours a year worth of demand. The market share of electric heat is 69%. You run, run through the math and you've got the loads of 5.67 average megawatts or 49,680 megawatt hours a year when you multiply through. Every year, uh, this the, the math is done in the model and it's done, uh, done for all land uses. And you can just basically, through bookkeeping and accounting, uh, determine what the loads currently are and what they're forecast to be by changing those assumptions with respect to a particular load growth path. So it's very explicit with respect to the detail between, between uh, maintaining the detail between and connection between the load forecast and appliance efficiency uh, uh, standards or potential assessments. So uh, that's its real advantage is, is it's explicit. This is the trade-off curve I talked about before, uh, efficiency capital trade-off curve. Every one of these little end, end use forecasting models uh, has one of these built into it. It basically says, here's what consumer choice would be given the current, the current capital cost or fuel cost of a particular uh, commodity and what the efficiency requirements might be. So uh, there's a technology trade-off curve that looks at at the unit level at every appliance, a light bulb or energy energy consuming device and says, at what capital cost do I get what kind of efficiency improvement? And then it asks the question, what would consumers do if they were given a curtain electric or gas price and had to make a trade off between buying fuel and spending capital? And so those are the technology trade off curves. They trade off uh, near term cost with long term capital and uh, life cycle cost uh, that might result if those those estimates uh, need to be consistent between the assessments uh, poten potential assessments and as matter of fact many of the potential assessments to, are used to derive these trade-off curves for load forecasting models because they have this detail about with increasing cost how much more efficient can i make my product so let's turn out uh, the hybrid forecasting model which is a combination of end use structure and econometric models uh, in some terms of art, uh, and I think some utilities use what they call statistically adjusted engineering models. These are the same as a, uh, as a hybrid model, so you might hear that term bantied about. They combine, again, end use detail uh, with an econometric est estimate. They may or might, may not have every end use listed as an end use model, but they have the major ones uh, where, so they can take that end use consumption and tailor it uh, to fit uh, engineering estimates and using uh, econometric estimates to determine whether those engineering estimates need to be calibrated. So you can make an engineering estimate of what a house you uses, then you do survey and econometrics to determine what houses are using in aggregate, and you can break down how much of that space heating versus space cooling, and you use the econometric estimates to temper the engineering estimates to get them calibrated so that they what, what your survey data and your econometric estimates uh, reveal about actual consumption, the engineering model gets calibrated for that. They're appropriate for long-term policy analysis and for long-term for load forecasting because they had some of the advantages of engineering engineering uh, end use models. They have the detail, but they also have the, the regressions, relationships between price and use and other factors built into them so they can uh, they're sort of a, a hybrid that optimizes the benefits of both the end use model and the econometric uh, attributes of modeling. Uh, they capture both equipments and consumer behaviors. Uh, they enable analysis of policy because again, you can impose particular standards or codes or, you, or policy analysis in, the, in there because you have the end use detail to do that and they can respond based on the economics. Disadvantages are very similar to an end use model and that they are data requirements for the end use component are pretty similar to end use models. It, and, and it also depends on the level of granularity. The more end uses there are in the hybrid models, the more uh, data requirements there are. They can be difficult to explain uh, results. Uh, 
like many load forecasting models, how did you get this number? Uh, requires uh, some expertise and in, in communication to make that make folks un help folks understand how a particular relationship actually turns out to uh, produce loads in the end. All right, uh, choosing one of these really depends on the kinds of things you're interested in uh, and the dimensions of load forecasting. So uh, choosing between these various approaches uh, depends on, uh, particularly if you're getting into the end use level or the hybrid model types of, of approaches, which are most amenable to long-term planning. You Temporal issues become important you need an annual forecast, a monthly forecast, an hourly forecast, a quarterly forecast. If you're planning for long-term energy needs, it might be an annual forecast is enough. Uh, if you're planning for long-term capacity needs, you probably need hourly level granularity in the load forecast. If you're planning for ancillary service needs or operational needs, you might need some hourly forecast because that's where the ancillary service values uh, show up. So depending upon uh, the load forecasting question, uh, the dimension of temporal uh, fidelity uh, is uh, fundamentally related to the problem you're trying to address. With respect to sectoral relationships, you might have residential, commercial, industrial sectors, which are driven by different variables. You want to separate those out. For long-term policy analysis and modeling specific building types, you probably want to have inside those uh, sectors individual industrial uh, sectors modeled, individual building types modeled, individual appliances modeled. And specific, specifically, if you've got large industrial loads that dominate your, your system, you might want to handle them individually rather than as a sector level average. A couple, some other choices, some examples here of the, of the sector level breakdowns. Here's residential, commercial, transportation sector, residential pretty standard, single family, multifamily, manufactured homes, uh, commercial sector, bunch of building types, uh, transportation, you have different mode, transportation modes, all of which have different uh, energy consuming characteristics and that may or may not be electrification uh, oriented. So you might have uh, on uh, transportation, like, like vehicle transportation, electrification is important, uh, passenger freight and, and others may or may not be uh, because they're not, unless you've got electrification of, of trains, electrification of freight lines. Uh, so all of those things, depending upon the, the technology that influences them with respect to electricity, may or may not be important. So you break those down based on whether or not you think your those were going to be a major influence on low growth going forward. Uh, choice of dimensions with respect to modeling, there are three others in addition to temporal and sectoral. We've got geographic and use and generally the granularity of all these things. Uh, geographic, you might need different sub areas forecast because you've got either economic conditions or policies that differ significantly county to county, state to state, or you've got transmission or distribution limitations into certain areas that influence that you wanna see whether that load growth grows faster there because of the transmission constraint or a particular distribution node uh, problem. Uh, you may need separate forecasts for those uh, so that you can track that independently. And in addition to the potential for the demand response and efficiency in those areas separately. Uh, and use granularity really relates to whether you expect technology change to be a major influence, the, the fuel, fuel choice and standards, whether building retrofits uh, are a major component going forward. If they are, you wanna make sure you've got that end use identified uh, that's a, being affected by the retrofit. Granularity, uh, just granularity increases uh, the cost and complexity of forecasting. The more details you got to keep track of, the more data you have to have, have to drive that. When you basically start making up data about all the detail you have, you probably overstep the bounds of, 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 that, of veracity. So uh, detail's great if you can support it through uh, data collection. Uh, it's uh, the hobgoblin of a of, of load forecaster to keep track of all those to make sure the load forecast actually calibrates with reality because all those end uses have to have to tally up to a total that matches reality and making sure that all the details uh, track that uh, can be difficult. It's expensive to maintain all that detail uh, because it requires 
regular customer surveys and data analysis. Um, and ultimately, in many cases, the level of granularity will be determined by the purpose of the forecast and uh, use of the forecast and largely uh, in the final analysis, the amount of money you have to spend and the time you have to do, to do the work. So, uh, some final notes on dimensionality of a load forecast. It's possible to include different levels of detail across sectors. Uh, many modeling, many utility modeling systems have end use forecast or hybrid models for the residential commercial sector uh, and move to econometric models for industrial and transportation sector because the end use aggregations or disaggregations there are much more difficult uh, to do than they are in the residential and uh, commercial sector. In addition, as I said earlier, the scope and dimensions of the load forecasting really are determined by availability of data and the budget you have to secure and maintain that data. So, some, in summary, we've got model used in, in development. Uh, we got load forecasting, uh, capacity expansion models and resource adequacy models, which we'll talk about later. My summary assessment is that what we now see is the most prevalent, but also the most problematic uh, for load forecasts are econometric models. Those are the ones that are mostly used in the country. Uh, we see some end use models and hybrid models uh, showing up, particularly in use, as I said, in the residential and, and commercial sectors. And they're much more relevant for connecting the dots when you're treating energy efficiency as a resource, moving to an end use or hybrid model uh, which is end use econometric models, uh, are much more useful so that you can treat EE as a resource or demand response as a, e as a resource because you can maintain that close connection between the load forecast modeling and the potential assessment so that when you when they, they meet in the capacity expansion model, you have internal consistency between the two. And let's look at uncertainty next. Take a breath. Hey, Tom. Yeah. yeah. I'll talk and let you take a breath. Um, okay. I just wanted to check in with with Brad and see uh, if there's questions that are coming in because I know we're scheduled to end in three minutes, but um, yep. Tom has, I think, maybe about 12 more slides. So if there's not a lot of questions, I, I was curious if we could use that time to finish the presentation or just wanted to see where we're at. Yeah. Um... Hang on a second here. I would uh, say just keep going for now. Um, we don't really have a whole lot of qu questions, really. Actually, none at the moment. Well, one, then I have a couple, but uh, I I say we just go forward because this I you know the uh, uncertainty is such an important issue to address. So uh, and and the way this. The, schedule was laid out i mean there is a fair amount of time that we can work with here so just go ahead okay that sounds great thank you thanks Natalie. so uh let's look at the major sources of uncertainty we've got load uncertainty which i'll talk mostly about uh it has to do with business cycles uh, post 2008 recession we saw uh, as a result of the financial crisis the covid 19 impact uh, certainly in impacted business cycles and consumption changed, uh, changed consumption considerably. Technology shifts as we get electrification of transportation or distributed generation affecting loads going forward, there's some greater uncertainty there. We have resource uncertainty, which we'll talk about uh, in an ensuing session, uh, output costs, construction lead times, technology change, those uh, are connected in, in to load uncertainty. Uh, wholesale market price uncertainty and regulatory uncertainty that you know, required conductions in uh, greenhouse gas emissions of uh, being the dominant uh, in front of mind right now. So let's move just to load uncertainty and just talk about that. So uh, perfect foresight, which means that there's no uncertainty about future load growth can get you into trouble. Here's an example from the Northwest, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, as I said, let's go back. We have these load forecasts that I showed you earlier, uh, starting in 1960 in this case, and then 
the econometric uh, load forecast coming on in 1980, which was significantly lower, and actual loads. And you, know, you got 33,400 gigawatt hours of forecasting error and only five years into the future. That was fairly significant. As we get into the details of this, uh, the real world example of having, as Natalie pointed out, too many resources. Goldilocks got, sat in the in the wrong chair. Uh, the Northwest is, was back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s was uh, underwritten, uh, had a lot of resources coming from the Bonneville Power Administration off the federal hydro projects and the Columbian Snake River dams. Its prices were pretty stable at wholesale market level. Excuse me. In uh, nominal terms, in 1938 through 1974, its rates didn't change at all. Uh, it was 0.38 cents uh, a kilowatt hour, less than less than a half a cent kilowatt hour at the wholesale level. That changed pretty markedly when we started building thermal plants, and then had no load growth to sell those plants to. EPA's rates went up uh, 418 percent in real dollars uh, in five years. And that had a major impact on loads. Uh, it was the, an over forecast of uh, over robust forecast of future load growth meant we had significant older overbuilding, no loads to go around to sell it to, so rates went up. Another example on the other side of this <coughs> was underbuilding in response to expectations of low loads uh, during the. 1990s, uh, we had wholesale market prices that were pretty low because loads were down due to recessions. Uh, we had a series of uh, above water years, above average water years, so retail prices were, retail rates were seeing the advantage of lots of hydropower availability. <coughs> Excuse me. And so market prices in wholesale were really cheap. Uh, this led to the West Coast energy prices. And so here's prices from May of 19. These are monthly prices at the wholesale trading hub of mid Columbia uh, from 1990, May of 1996 to May of, of uh, 2000, four year period. And they hovered around uh, two cents a kilowatt hour or less. And then a sudden they took off and they went up to something on the order of $800 a megawatt hour for an entire month average uh, in the fall of uh, 2000. And that was a consequence of about a 4,000 megawatt shortage in resource availability when we didn't, we got average water rather than uh, above normal water. <clears throat> so the cost of having too few resources was a 30% a increase in the average retail uh, revenue requirement per kilowatt hour sold in the Northwest uh, over about a three year period is that echoed through the retail rate development process. So there's a real cost of being wrong and the load forecast had a lot to do with that. Loads, loads and resources were connected and, and the loads were built through either to a high, too high of a forecast or not adequate to be the current forecast. So uh, you've got load uncertainty in Indiana too, uh, industrial sales are often the driver of this. Here's the period of time between 1990 and 2020. And you've got a three circles here where industrial loads uh, dramatically change both up and down due to short-term business cycles, no doubt, or some other manifestation of, the imp of impacts. And those, consequent, those had consequences, I'm sure, uh, for near-term revenue requirements and, uh, and the utilities or the marketplace or those individual customers. So load uncertainty is a, a big deal. Large industrial customers drive the short term a bit, but in the long term, the overall load forecast connection with things like changes in technology, changes in uh, demographics, and changes in the advent of electrification and policies like codes and standards can have a pretty dramatic impact on, uh, load on, on the uncertainty of loads. In the past, this was a big problem because we had resource lead times that were big and long. So you could add a thousand megawatt nuclear plant, but it took 10 to 12, 14 years to get built. Uh, coal plant took eight to 10 years and was about five, 600 megawatts. Now we have gas-fired CTs 
that took a lot less to build. We have wind and PVs that are much shorter lead time. <clears throat> and of course, energy efficiency and demand response are much shorter lead time. So the load uncertainty and the manifestation of that in terms of, of real risk was lots greater in the past than it is today because we now have small size modular resources that we can rely on that mean that we have to be pretty good at load forecasting over a five year period not a 10 or 15 year period because the lead time for those resources is not those lengthy periods of time on the other hand the lead time for transmission and perhaps distribution of new substations can also extend to that 10 to 15 year period so instead of generating resources being the issue it's now the networking of those generating resources or the or the, the even the connection of the distribution resources to the system that has that that really focuses your attention on load uncertainty and maybe at a more granular level because of the the sub-regional nature of some of those problems where you have a distribution constraint or a transmission constraint the issue really is not so much your whole system load forecast but areas within your system that have various transmission or distribution constraints, because those are the long lead time problem, and those are where the forecast can have the greatest errors. So uh, energy efficiency can also have some um, delays in construction. It's to be treated fairly. Uh, the Northwest had this as a cumulative efficiency goal from 1984 to 1999, and it was undermet. Uh, cumulative achievements were less than the targets had been. We had the West Coast energy crisis uh, and that put a two before to folks heads. And so now energy efficiency now exceeds targets even on a cumulative basis. So uh, there was a wake up call that energy efficiency could solve some of these uh, near term forecasting error problems by building it on an annual basis to keep loads more in track with uh, resources. And so that you had a closer match between loads and resources. You didn't have a lot of overbuilding, a lot of underbuilding, produced by major resources coming online uh, that were large in scale, uh, more match, and so the energy efficiency could be more matched to load growth. And so uh, you have these uh, less, a smaller error band around the load forecast problem. So the future is uncertain. This is sort of a summary here. Uh, regardless of the brilliance of models uh, and modelers for that matter, uh, the historical fit, the economic theory behind it, uh, the future is still largely uncertain and Errors with significant uh, economic consequences can and will have uh, result in uh, when you use a point forecast, you you can go seriously wrong. So what can we do about it? Well, embrace uncertainty. Let's get through with that. Understand the strength and weaknesses of your forecasting model. What impacts does it capture? Which ones doesn't? Which one does it miss? And how difficult is it to ensure you can calibrate your efficiency potential with your potential assessment? Uh, can you conduct efficiency uh, sensitivity tests on the primary drivers to see which ones are the most important? Can you develop a range forecast uh, so that you can uh, integrate these uh, the, the range forecast into a capacity expansion modeling process? So if you're not just saying, I've got a high, low, and medium, and that's the only cases that matter. Well, there's a bunch of intermediate cases, and the probability of being on a low versus the high is important. So maybe you need to look at not only just three, but multiple more cases, and perhaps the distribution across those cases. Conducting sensitivity analysis helps. You can identify the forecast sensitivity by changing the principal drivers and see what really matters. And so you focus more on data analysis and, and inspection and stakeholder engagement on those things that seem to matter the most. Uh, do the sensitivities when you use them really make sense? That is, does the direction that the sensitivity changes and the magnitude of the sensitivity uh, by changing the assumption of a driver seem like it makes gut level sense? If it changes, if the if the sign is wrong, when you say, I, I'm expecting this thing to produce positive load growth and it produces negative load growth, maybe something is wrong with the model. Or maybe something that's counterintuitive that you need to understand. Uh, sensitivity analysis can inform uh, the range of forecast. You might want to put in, as I said earlier, 
uh, focus more on the drivers that make the most difference and less on the drivers that make less difference in the model with respect to making sure that you've captured the potential outcomes. Using a rain forecast, uh, if you use a deterministic model uh, in your capacity expansion, you can optimize a portfolio for each forecast in your range. So you get a portfolio that's optimized for the high, a portfolio that's optimized for the low, and one that's optimized for the medium. You can use also a capacity expansion model that, that uses stochastic techniques, or Monte Carlo techniques, uh, which has perfect foresight for each future, but it plans for many, many, many different future conditions. So it has a optimized portfolio for hundreds of different forecast futures from which you can learn a great deal about how important a particular resource is to, to across a, an array of futures. You can also use Monte Carlo simulations without perfect foresight where the model can make errors and build something it turns out it doesn't need uh, so that you can look at resource plans that have uh, the lowest cost for, for varying levels of risk. These are three different types of capacity expansion approaches uh, in risk analysis that involve different levels of low of, of a range of different components of a, of a range forecast. And we'll talk about those at, at, an, at another session. But it can the range forecast is fed in in each of these cases used a little bit different. So I think now we are ready for questions and if my voice holds out. All right, thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, let me ask you perhaps an unfair question, but um, um, is the, there's probably not a good answer to this, but in a world where we're increasingly gonna have distributed generation, how do we project load in that circumstance when increasingly the load that the utility is seeing is gonna be the net load? And of course, we know that net load could be very dependent upon the weather conditions, um, especially if you're looking at, as you were saying earlier, you want to look at what, how much capacity to be building. Well, that's so dependent upon what net, uh, what DGs out there, and then uh, what is actually generating at the, uh, you know, depending upon the weather across certain hours. So I just throw that out there for, uh, not that I really expect a, a answer is it's just that's one of those huge areas of uncertainty as I see it. Yeah, I would I would agree that it, it definitely is one of the, the principal areas of uncertainty and there's a couple ways with respect to dealing with that issue in a planning context. Uh, you can sort of uh, take what's given and try and estimate how much that's going to um, influence potential loads going forward and you know, tracking DG connections, tracking DG contributions and impact on load shape uh, so that you're collecting the data through time and being able to project it forward. Another act, uh, action that one can take there, in addition to looking at energy efficiency and demand response as potential offsets uh, use of uh, those in your in, instead of a load forecast impact, look at them as supply side options. You can look at DG as a supply side option and build a portfolio analysis, including energy efficiency, demand response, and other DERs like DG and battery storage uh, to see if you'd want to buy it uh, to improve both. Uh, reliability or improve your understanding and operational. Uh, you know, ability to dictate when that battery is run so that you can look at the value proposition of having those things on your system and set up uh, rate designs and or incentive programs to encourage the kind of development that's most beneficial to the system and also beneficial to offer in financial incentives or benefits to customers to do the right thing for the system as opposed to do something that that uh, presents more problems to the system. So treating treating those as resources that's selectable in a capacity expansion model 
see which kinds of operations most benefit the system and provide that same in, uh, information in the form of incentives and, and other, other uh, program offerings to your customers so that rather than just take it as it comes, you have some way to direct the traffic uh, to ways that make it more beneficial. Okay, I have another question here. Um, in terms of, this is a question we we see frequently when we have our uh, IRP stakeholder meetings with the utilities, I think. Um, how do we capture in the load forecast the possibility of, of uh, impacts of more extreme weather, possibly over time? I mean, I know some utilities have their, for their uh, modeling and their load forecasting and stuff go from using maybe 30 years of, of, of historical weather data. Now they've cut it down to 20 years or 15 years or 10 years, of the most recent data. Um, but how do you, and this may be more of the impact on the, the impact upon your uh, net, net load or your peak demands in terms of the extremes of weather in the winter and the summer when you're looking, because again, not every year is going to be the same. We know some years can be really very different in their weather. So I, I, I throw that out there. Yeah, I, I'll do an example. One response, the Northwest Power Council that I used to work for in its eighth plan, which is under development right now, um, contracted with the University of Washington uh, to uh, downscale a, a national or international climate model to look at the climate impacts of, in the Northwest of uh, on a going forward basis because it's doing a 20 year plan and, and we're into 2050 by the end of the plan. So it's looking at what those climate impacts might be. So it downscaled uh, from a, a global model down to the Northwest impacts to look at both precipitation and, and, and temperatures, which are the major drivers of load and, and resource availability in the hydro system. And they ended up taking those and, and producing simulations of future weather conditions rather than historical weather conditions and use those for both projecting uh, the hydro output as well as the number of heating degree days and cooling degree days to be anticipated and use those simulated weather conditions including solar uh, to both do the, the loads forecast and the potential assessments so we have a climate that's warming and so there's less cooling or less heating needed in the northwest and more cooling so uh, air conditioning loads are going up therefore the benefits of air conditioning efficiency improvements go up uh, but the winter uh, and winter loads are going down so the benefits of insulation go down so they're using that as the basis for both the projecting future load growth and doing the potential assessment so you know that's a on a large scale what might be done uh, and probably collaboratively because you're looking at a regional impact rather than just a single state. So that's a uh, the the downscaling is um, uh, techniques are have some uncertainty associated with them, but they at least are a, a, an aim to get at, at uh, rather than just throwing up your hands, taking some stab at it, at uh, trying to get a handle on what those impacts might look like. All right, I think we have a, uh, a question from Simon Lomax. Um, he says, uh, thank you for such a detailed walkthrough of the different forecasting tools. Can you talk about unit retirements and how those are factored into the future resource capacity forecast? I'm not sure that that fits in this. Because um, it, it, we're talking about load forecast, or I think he's talking about resource retirements. Yeah. At least that's how I interpret the question. Uh, there's also unit retirements of, of existing appliances and uh, stock, basically stock turnover. So that it, if it's related to that, um, in the hybrid models and in end use models, you have explicit accounting of stock turnover. So you have a lifetime assumption for a refrigerator or light bulb or what have you and uh, stock 
rotates through. Uh, and it, so it has a, a, a vintage structure accounting for the vin various vintages uh, so that, you know, some years we have more housing stars, commercial buildings and others. And those are tracked in the model through a big accounting technique that says every you know, 20 years after a, a, a cohort of refrigerators were installed, um, some of those are decaying out of the system and being replaced by more efficient ones. So, you know, those that's how that's done inside those models. That's how it affects us the load forecast and the resource efficiency potential associated with that turnover happens uh, based on the baseline that the, that is changing through time. So uh, I don't know if that addresses the question that he asked or not, but that that's relevant to the load forecasting. Uh, let, uh, me let me ask it. Let me throw the questions open to the other speakers if, if they uh, um, have any questions that they would like to ask. Put put uh put you guys on the spot real quickly here. Okay, I, I'm not I'm not hearing any. Oh. I just something just popped up. Did something just come in from uh Do you want me to just ask the question, Dr. Bourne? This is Anna. Hey, um I think Anna Summer just asked a question. Yeah, can you she, hear me? She, uh yes. Yes, we can. I okay. will sh shut up and let you go. <laughs> I just thought it might be easier to ask it orally instead of writing it down. Um, I was just curious, Tom, uh, do you happen to know of any other um, econometric end use models beyond iTrans? Um, well, they're, they have their, their trade name for their statistically adjusted engineering models, the SAE model. But uh, if going back uh, multiple years, um, the old Oak Ridge models and EPRI produced multiple versions of what I would call hybrid models, which were end use econometric models. The council uses one uh, that was invented a long time ago called Energy 2020. It's an end use uh, uh, econometric model. Uh, so there are lots of non-trade named ones uh, that are uh, some uh, that were created. Oh, the Oak Ridge model was created by Oak Ridge National Labs way back when. Uh, uh, DOE has their NEMS model, which is a the same kind of a a model. Uh, I think the NREL's models, uh, low forecasting models, are very similar to that. And EPRI had a whole cadre of models related to that or end use econometric models for both commercial and residential sector. So, you know, there are other models that are uh, are similarly done. They're just not uh, commercially you know, available. Mm. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I mean, there may be some, I, you know, don't hold me to that, but this, <laughs> I, I haven't been on the hunt for, for a lot of those kind of models, but, but they, they're definitely, uh, Vendors out there besides I try to, uh, that have access to those kinds of models. Thanks. 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 Anything else from the other speakers? Yeah, I have uh, another question here. We have generally little idea of what future new standards, um, efficiency standards, will be after the first few years of a forecast period. Does the uncertainty of future codes and standards impact the preference for end use and hybrid models for long term forecast? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it matters much uh, because 
in the energy efficiency potential assessment, uh, you want to be indifferent as to which mechanisms are anticipated to produce the savings. You know, they might be adopted by consumers independent of programs. They might be operated through programs. They might be captured through codes and standards, and therefore some combination of those. So the potential assessment and the load forecast are really agnostic with respect to remaining potential uh, and how it's going to be captured. Uh, so that you know, you, the, the value proposition presented by hybrid models or end use econometric models more generally are uh, that they allow you to explicitly model the potential for policy changes like codes and standards but they aren't, that's not their only benefit. Their principal benefit on them is connecting the load forecast and the potential assessments. So those are calibrated and internally consistent. So the load forecast that's used in the capacity expansion model doesn't undercount or overstate the, the remaining potential uh, that is used in the supply curves that feed it for, for, for energy efficiency. And that's the real value. The, the econometrics models, which might be perfectly suited for short term peak load forecasting and other things, uh, can't give you the kinds of granularity and internal consistency that the end use econometric models do to make sure that you have that explicit uh, connection between the potential assessment and the load forecast. Um, yeah, I mean, I do have a, a follow up from Simon Lomax. He says, apologies. He was referring to the retirements of power plants. And how is it that how is that factored into the modeling, if at all? Well, it, it if it shows up as a um, this is a speculation, if if you've got a retirement that's a forced retirement that changes uh, the revenue requirements and impacts future rates, uh, that's going to be echoed into the load forecast model. So, or if you have to buy, build a bunch of other new plants that's going to increase revenue requirements, that'll feed back into the load forecast model. So, anything that produces changes in revenue requirements is going to impact the, the prices that show up in the load forecasting model, which, you which will, because it's an econometric model, which will influence future loads, either through changes in overall price response or uh, loads. And the price response, the loads, the in the frozen efficiency case, the price response doesn't matter, but it does when you you factor in the, the final cost of the resource portfolio that's going to uh, make the, the, the make up the preferred portfolio, whatever that revenue requirement is, will be fed back in the load forecast to get your final load expectation and look at things like rate impacts and what have you. So it will influence it that way, but but not going into the capacity expansion model. Only what you only only what you know that comes out of the out of the portfolio model influences the load for, the final load forecast. Because you don't know what you have to build to replace those existing resources. This is Brad. Maybe this is a uh, related kind of type of question, but when you're doing the load forecasting, obviously the price of electricity is one of those components. Um, where is that? I mean, where does that price forecast come from? Because you kind of have a, a simultaneous relationship there. Price is going to be somewhat dependent upon the load forecast, and like you said, the uh, follow-on resource decisions. Uh, yeah, but, it's then, a, uh, but the price is also going to be dependent upon the load. So, kind of like a circular thing there. It is. It's an. It's actually an iterative process uh, in most IRPs, uh, where you have to close the loop back to the load forecast, and maybe cycle through one more time to see um, whether you get a different answer. But when you use the frozen efficiency approach, uh, what you want to get right. Are the prices that affect uh, fuel choice, so that you get the right number of units going forward? And one technique of doing that is to, to uh, allow the model, 
the forecasting model, you have to choose the, the, the make fuel selections based on what you think the prices will be going forward with a proxy portfolio. And those units that come out of that, the fuel switch, the fuel choices that come out of that that drive the number of units for water heating and other competitive fuel competitive end uses. Those those become the basis of the baseline load forecast for both the capacity expansion model and the resource assessment, potential resource assessment. Once you go through and build a portfolio to satisfy that particular one, that particular uh, level load forecast or load forecast, range forecast, uh, you need to feed that back into the uh, load forecast model that the revenue requirement that comes from that portfolio to see whether or not it's it's similar to the to the proxy port, uh, prices that you put in before. If you if the prices are comparable and you don't see major food changes in, in fuel choice as a consequence of, of the portfolio, then you're probably done. But you know, this can be an iterative process if you, for example, have to build significant significant resources and change and, and prices move up significantly uh, and you see what was electric water heat being taken over by gas water heat or vice versa, then uh, you're not done. You have to iterate to get, to get closure on that because you haven't uh, really reflected what the, what's likely to be the relationship between price and fuel choice. But that's, that's, that's the nexus of the problem is price and fuel choice, not overall loads because prices are not used in the frozen efficiency case to change efficiency. They don't change what consumers buy as an efficient product, they only change what they buy um, uh, with respect to fuel time. All right, with, with that, let's uh, close this portion of the uh, discussion this afternoon. So I'd like to thank you, Tom and and uh, Natalie for uh, your great work here. Uh, if you wanna stay online, of course, for uh, the next presentations and maybe we'll have some follow-up questions of uh, later for everybody but i would uh, uh like to turn it over now since we're pretty much on time to um eric miller or and chad burnett and i don't know if if uh, either one of you guys if you guys have talked about who wants to go first or how you want to handle that but uh um i'll let you I'll let one of you just uh, take over now and then see if we can share your presentation from your screen. Okay, let's see. Can, can you see that? Yes, we can. All right. Yes, I can. Cool. Good. That's good. Well, Bob or uh, Brad, Bob, yeah, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity in the IURC for uh, AES and DNF for us to present our methodology um, to including energy efficiency and load forecasts. Um, so getting into the agenda, is it advancing? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so at, uh, and oh you know, yeah, just brief introduction. So I'm Eric Miller. Uh, I manage uh, resource planning for AES Indiana, so responsible for the resource planning group there. And we'll, we'll our group will be you know work, beginning work on the RIRP. Um, well, actually, we're beginning the market potential study this summer, uh, an in use analysis piece of it, which I'll get into a little bit. And then we'll go uh, fully into the uh, resource planning next year, and then we file November 1st of next year. Um, so, yeah, that's it's coming up pretty quick. Um, so, yeah, as far as agenda, so I'm going to cover ITRON statistically adjusted in use methodology, load forecasting methodology, which uh, Tom was was mentioning there. Um, then I'm going to get into the types of energy efficiency that we need to to capture in the load forecast. Um, then specifically how we capture organic energy efficiency, and this, this gets into that SAE, that statistically adjusted and use approach, and then how utility sponsored EE is captured. This is, this is really kind of more of the challenge uh, that, that we encounter with load forecasting. Um, and then specifically, I'll, I'll get into it here in just a minute. Um, and then uh, finally, we need to, to have an IRP that, that is, has basically any planned energy efficiency removed. So all the programs need to be removed. Everything that we, we had planned previously needs to be removed because that becomes selectable uh, in the resource planning model when we do the, the, the bundling. So this is a, a really high level overview of the statistically adjusted in use model. 
And, you know, as Tom was mentioning, you know, the, the challenge is we need to, so, you know, we have this econometric approach and, and load forecasters back in the day used to just use, I mean, you could pretty much use GDP to forecast what the sales were going to be. The two were, were really strongly correlated and, and it worked, worked well enough. And so that's how load forecasters used to do it. Um, however, you know, starting around the, the rece recession in 2008, load really dropped off. And then we saw um, ISA happen. So this is like significant codes and standards, particularly for lighting. And we, so we see load drop off significantly. And then GDP starts, keeps growing, but load goes flat because of all this energy efficiency that's happening now. And it's, it's more just codes and standards energy efficiency. And then also utilities start really implementing programs. And so load just goes really flat. So that's where this, this hybrid model, that's what this is, uh, hybrid model comes in. And so you can see in the hybrid model, we have, you know, at the top there, the in-use index. So, so I first want to start the, the statistically adjusted in-use model has basically three composite variables and that's X cool, X heat and X other. And so cool captures the, the cooling components, the cooling measures, you know, AC and those sorts of technologies. Uh, the heating captures any kind of electric heat. So uh, heat pumps, those sorts of things. And then base is uh, the other is the base base load technologies like lighting and those sorts of technologies. And so you have this in use index at the top, and then you have basically the the economics uh, which get fit in fed in as well. And for this particular, this is the residential model. So for economics, we're specifically looking at number of households, household size, so the number of persons, people in household and also uh, income of the household. So those are the key economic components that go into the model. And then we have weather as well, so cooling degree days and heating degree days. And then another key variable uh, is price. So this one was one that they were just discussing, um, Brad and Tom were discussing. So price being, you know, so we take a price forecast for what we believe prices are going to be and load that into the forecast. So there's some price elasticity that's captured in there as well. So then the commercial model, oh yeah, I did want to mention, so in the residential model, we're forecasting average use. So this is average use per customer. So we have a residential model that's average use, that is the, the dependent variable. And then we also have another model that captures number of customers. So you multiply the two together and you get ultimately get your sales forecast. So average use times customers out of two different models for residential. On the commercial side, we're, it's very similar setup. So we have the X cool, X heat, and X other variables but we're forecasting sales as opposed to average use here. And then we also, we have a separate customer model, but the two aren't directly directly related in that you get your sales from, from both. Um, and so some key differences here, the economic drivers are GDP and employment. So we have two variables and we actually create a weighted economic variable here. So it's gonna be weighted. We typically weight it 80% to employment and 20% to GDP. And this, this all goes back to what I was saying earlier, is that correlation between sales and GDP just is, isn't as strong as it used to be. So we use employment as, as the key, one of the key driving variables uh, as far as the economics for the commercial model. And then finally, we have an industrial model. So the industrial model is that this is more of a classic econometric model where you have uh, output, GDP, and employment as the key driving variables. We also put cooling degree days in there because industrial customers are somewhat weather sensitive to, to the cooling cooling side of it. And then it's, it's just basic econometric model. And the reason we don't have the SAE data in here is because, so we get this SAE data from uh, the uh, Energy Inf Information Administration, their annual energy outlet, they put it together. And they don't create a uh, data set for the industrial customers. And part of the reason for that is they're just so different in terms of the, the types of customers. Whereas like you think about the residential customer, the residential sector, and you know, customers all use energy relatively the same way. Whereas on the industrial side, you have very different industries and that sort of thing. So they don't, they don't put out a, uh, a forecast necessarily for end uses there. So the types of efficiencies and the types of, uh, equipment, uh, it, it can vary greatly. So they don't have a, a forecast they put together there. All right, so getting into the two types of efficiency that to capture in the load forecast. Um, so organic efficiency, you know, as I mentioned, this is, this is gonna be 
naturally occurring efficiency, codes and standards efficiency. Um, and this, as I mentioned, we, we we get from the EIA, so that's how we capture it in the forecast. In the next slide, I can I'll show you a, an example of this data that's graphically represented, so you can see how that looks. And then utility sponsored EE. So this is uh, basically utility program implementation, all the energy efficiency that's related to that. And this becomes a little bit of a challenge. And the challenge there, it, it isn't necessarily a challenge to capture the planned DSM or the planned EE in the forecast. It's that some of this EE, so if the, if the utility's been doing energy efficiency for multiple years, it gets, it gets captured in the trend in the sales data because it's been happening. And so that when you put it, when you load up the models, the model is going to pick up some of that and it's going to, the forecast that's going to spit out is going to include some assumptions or, or some, some trend that's related to energy efficiency that's in there. So you have to, you have to figure out a way to get that out. So just briefly on uh, the organic efficiency uh, piece, the naturally occurring efficiency. So this shows a, this is a residential gas heat customer. And this is what their historic energy. I mean, this is this is so this is regional data. So this is like the average. You could think about it as like the average regional uh, east, north, central regional is the data we use customer and how they how their their energy profile has changed in use profile has changed over time. And so you have basically the history. You can see it's it's dropped off due to codes and standards. And I should mention there is no utility sponsored DSM in this. This is all due to codes and standards. And so one of the things you'll notice the big big factor there is lighting and how efficient lighting has become. So you have the the green is miscellaneous. So this is miscellaneous plug loads, and you can see this is this is getting bigger and bigger as we go out over time out into the future. And part of that is just, you know, the Internet of Things, uh, more plug loads, laptops, uh, phones, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, the fork they're forecasting, we're just going to see more of that in terms of uh, saturation of those those types of equipment. And then the big one where you see the big drop off is lighting and that, you know, you can see it really starts in about 2000, eh, 2005, 2006. And then ISA happens and this is really LED saturation. And we're we're getting to the point now where we're where we're almost saturated with LEDs, and we do expect that to start to flatten out here in the next couple of years, um, as as we get to that point. And then this also has appliances, water heating, and then heating and cooling as well, and the assumptions behind that. So this this captures all of the efficiency and saturations of these different types of technologies, which which ultimately, as you know, when when I showed you the composite variables, they make it into that load forecast. Um, as part of the, the the SAE model. So that's naturally occurring efficiency. So now the, the challenge with the utility sponsored energy efficiency. So you'll see um, what this shows from 2008 to 2020. This is just an example. This isn't actually um, anything that we actually use. So if you were to use an estimation period, so an estimation period is the the period how far back you go in terms of the history in order to, to forecast the future in your models. If you were to use an estimation period that went, goes all the way back to 2008, all the way to present, you'll notice that the blue is the sales, and then the gray that sits on top of it, that's going to be the, the historic efficiency that we, we've been doing. And so what, what's going to happen there is this, the model's going to pick up that historic efficiency, and then the forecast you get on the other side of it is going to end up having some of that efficiency embedded in it. So the challenge is to try to get that embedded efficient embedded efficiency out of the, the the sales trend that comes out. So I guess ultimately what happens is you can't just you can't just take your planned DSM and and lop off you know what however much you 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 think it's going to be because you could potentially be double counting energy efficiency because it's already there's already some efficiency assumptions embedded in the forecast. So then the question becomes, so how do we how do we isolate this embedded DSM? And so the way we do that, and this is this is really ITRON's recommendation, ITRON's approach, is we take we create what's called the DSM variable. And so you have that that the sale the function, uh, the SAE function, which is X cool, X heat, X other, um, the three composite variables. 
and then you just add on a DSM variable to the end of that. And so what this DS DSM variable is, is it's a data stream of the historic DSM that we've performed and then any planned DSM that we have going forward. And so by doing that, you, you ultimately create a, a variable with a coefficient, which I'll get into here in just a minute, and it, the model automatically adjusts out any of that planned DSM going forward, and also at the same time, time accounts for the embedded DSM um, that, that we're trying to isolate. So let's really quick, let's, let's take a look at a, the DSM variable coefficient in the model statistics and how this all looks when you're modeling this. So this is an example of the DSM variable coefficient. And so, so basically we have, you have the, this is our model and we're forecasting sales here. So this is a commercial model. And so we have X other, uh, bleh, X other, X heat and X cool. So our three, three variables, or three ITRON variables, SAE variables, those composite variables. Then you have some binaries that you put on some, some weird, you know, weird months and stuff where, where you've had some extreme weather and those sorts of things. Um, and then you have the DSM variable here. So the model gives you a coefficient and the coefficient here is 0.584. And so what that tells you is that any DSM that's included in your data stream in that variable is gonna get, we're only gonna count 58.4% of that it, because it's assumed that 42.6% is already embedded in the sales trend. So the model's, the model's picking that relationship up. You know, it's, it's a, and, and what, what it's saying here is, you know, the p-value is really good, zero, the t-stat's five, negative five. And so it's basically saying this, this variable is, is critical to the model. I mean, it, it needs to be there. It's capturing a trend that your other variables aren't capturing. And so by including that, we're picking up. So now we've captured the uh, organic efficiency through, through the SAE data. We've captured the embedded efficiency. And then additionally, it's made an adjustment to the planned DSM, any planned programs, it's made an adjustment for that, um, you know, based on how much is embedded in the forecast. And so we end up with, uh, we end up with, with a, a forecast that includes all three. So now, as Tom mentioned, it, you know, this is, we're, we're developing an IRP forecast. So, you know, that's the methodology we'll use for budgets and trackers and anything, anything like that. And so what we did in 2019 is we took basically that forecast and we had, you know, all of the all of the historical DSM we performed, any forecasted energy efficiency as well. And so uh, this would in, at the time would have included DSM from the 2016 IRP. And so that that's all included. So we ended we have a forecast that include that that's that's a good forecast if that were the DSM that we were going to do. However, since we're when we're putting together an IRP we need to gross that forecast up for that planned DSM. So what we did was we basically just grossed it up exogenous to the model or outside the model. We just grossed it up for that planned DSM using the coefficients that were determined by the model. And so then ultimately what you end up with there is a forecast that's, that's grossed up for DSM, ready to go into the, the planning models. And then any DSM that happens in the future is going to be selectable. It's going to be selected uh, alongside other supply side options. And so, that's that's basically it. Um, yeah, Brad, I don't know if you want to um, if Chad goes, or do I take questions, or how, however you'd like to do it. Well, let me just make a quick uh, refresher announcement here. Um, again, um, on our end, we've tried to use that. The, I don't know, the chat box or whatever you call it on the YouTube channel. I'm not looking at that because I'll get confused with multiple screens going on here. Um, but uh, um, apparently we're having difficulty on our end submitting even test questions or comments. So, um, if, if, but it seems to be working for some people and not for others. So if that's the case then, and you're having difficulty, again, send your questions directly to me at B B, it's two B's O R U M at U R C dot I N dot G O V. Then also send it and or and and or you can send it to uh, uh, Bob Pauly and, and to confuse you, his is M Pauly P A U L E Y at U R C dot I N dot G O V. 
So um, we'll just see if that uh, restating that uh, helps people at all. Um, now I do have one question that did come in and it is from, uh, they, somebody says, uh, do uh, the SAE models differentiate by building types such as single family versus multifamily in the residential sector or offices versus restaurants in the commercial sector? In the commercial sector, it does. So it does by building type, uh, it does get that granular. In the residential side, it does not. It's, it's yeah, basically just taking an average across all, all types of housing. Then uh, another question here came in uh, from a Tim Devitt, I, uh, and he asked, when including the economic variable in the heat, cool, and other variables, one, are the economic variables indexed? And then two, are the economic variables, do you understand what's written, how this is written? Or is it just me that has this? Or I, I think it's, are the economic variables raised to a power of less than 0 0.5? Yeah, sorry, the, the typing was a little um, off there and, and I think that's how it should read. Did you want me to reread those two questions? No, I think I, think I got it, Brent. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so yes, they are indexed. And then two, they, it, it's not a power, they're not raised to a power less than, what was it, 0 0.05? 0 0.5. 0 0.5, 0 0.5. No, it, yeah, they're, they're raised to a power um, off the top of my head. I can't remember exactly what it is. Chad might, Chad might recall, uh, he, he, they also use the SAE model as well. Um, but yes, so yes, they're in the index, but no, it's not a power that low. Dr. Borman, I think you may be muted. Oh, I guess I was on mute. Or no, I wasn't. So, Chad, you ready? To, can you share your screen? Sure. Yep, yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yep, there, there. Yep, it's we're seeing uh, your screen right now, so it's working. All right, does that work? Yes, it does. At least for my view. Okay. Well, um, thanks again for the opportunity to present today on behalf of INM. Uh, you know, I think this is a very important topic. Uh, it's really very interesting. You know, we're going to get to hear lots of different perspectives on this topic, and I think it is good for us all to hear how different folks are handling energy efficiency in their load forecasts, um, because maybe we can all learn from each other. So, uh, again, thanks for the opportunity. From uh, I'm just gonna. All right, so from our perspective, uh, you know, the whole purpose of a DSM program or energy waste reduction program uh, is to really accelerate the adoption of an energy efficient technology. And this allows us, our customers, to be more efficient consumers of electricity. And, and it's really important as we go through the rest of our presentation to, to distinguish between what is happening overall energy efficiency versus how much you can attribute specifically to a DSM program. 
And so, you know, this is just a hypothetical example. If we had a cooling program where maybe you've got a, a customer that um, five years ago installed what they thought was a, a pretty reliable air conditioner at the time, uh, five years later, the company says, hey, we've got a, a rebate or an incentive. If you would upgrade that to a more efficient technology, and, uh, you know, should typically that thing would have died in about 10 years anyway. And so we're really just kind of accelerating the adoption of this more efficient technology because, again, 10 years from now when they go to, re to Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever they're going to go to, to replace some of these appliances, uh, there's a really good chance that the market will have already caught up to the efficiencies there. And so, you know, that, that's kind of a, the key pillar here in our, in our understanding of this is the idea that these DSM programs are really just accelerating the adoption of this technology that would happen organically or naturally anyway, but it's a way to really kind of make this happen faster. So, um, you know, one of the easiest examples that we can think of, of this is in the lighting uh, arena because that's where a lot of the focus was uh, when, we, when the company really started doing energy efficiency programs. And so here we've got an example of uh, INM and the Indiana jurisdiction compared to Kingsport, which is a sister company in Tennessee. And uh, you can see uh, the difference between them. This is just looking at their lighting consumption since 2008 when we started our DSM programs. And uh, the chart to the right shows that over the first 10 years, we saw about a 64% reduction in lighting load as a result of all this energy efficiency. But what's interesting about this is when you compare that to Kingsport, who, again, has no energy efficiency programs, they've never done a DSM program at all. So what you're seeing there is just really capturing what's happening in the market. And so there you can see the difference between, you know, kind of the control group who didn't do this DSM program versus INM where we did was roughly about 3%, even though they still achieved about 64% uh, reduction in that lighting over time. And so it really is capturing, you know, you can see even in the, the forecast horizon, the blue line INMs is lower than the orange line, which shows that we're, we're still assuming you're going to keep those savings uh, ahead of what would have happened if we'd done no programs. Now, you know, when we think about DSM and specifically lighting, it is often referred to as the low hanging fruit of DSM because it really was the easiest and the uh, the, the most effective or most impactful one to implement uh, early on. And, and the reason we say that, you know, if you look at the, the studies before ESA and back when e the Energy Policy Act of 2005 was just being enacted, you know, at that time, residential lighting made up roughly about, it was about 20% of the total residential consumption. And today it has dropped dramatically, again, as a result of the newer technology that's been deployed. Uh, but there is an issue here that we're learning and that we're starting to run into when it comes to energy efficiency, and it kind of goes with the, the whole economics of the law of diminishing returns, as well as the price of substitutes. And what that means is, is, you know, when you start to implement the lowest hanging fruit, those lowest cost, easiest to adopt, once you've already kind of done that, then the next level or tier of programs to implement, they tend to get a little more expensive. And, and let's just think about this, you know, as an example, for instance. So when you're when you're thinking about lighting, you know, the cost involved of, of actually installing this new technology was just to send anybody could install a light bulb. And so that didn't really take a whole lot of additional cost other than the technology itself. Some of the newer technologies that are out there, the newer efficient appliances, you know, when you start to having to hire now a licensed electrician or a plumber or a HVAC contractor, you know, the cost to all tends to you know drive those up a little bit more and so what we're seeing here and you can see in the chart to the left that over time our cost of per kilowatt hour of energy efficiency savings through these programs is continuing to go up and what's the other part of this when you think about the price of substitutes is looking at what's happening to the cost of other technologies when you think about that supply stack that you're looking at in the IRP that the cost of a whole lot of other uh, resources, especially the renewable resources, have really started to drop pr uh, pretty dramatically. And so when you put those two together, it's starting to really challenge the selection of some of these IRPs uh, of DSM and the IRP optimization, which again comes into play here because it's how much are we accounting for in our load forecast. So 
you know, another key concept here that we want to mention here is that the way that DSM program savings are measured is very different than the way that they are metered and modeled in a load forecast. And I, I firmly believe that you measure what matters. And in our industry, you measure what matters with a meter. And so let, let's think about this. When you, when you think about what's happening in the IRP forecast, specifically the load forecast that goes into there, all the other inputs, when you think about customer billings, uh, you know, the, the generation, all of those things, it, we have a meter on those that, so we know specifically what's happening there. But when it comes to the DSM numbers that we're going to adjust our load forecast for, those are generally coming from an engineering study where they say, okay, typically a lighting, a, an appliance in this specific program is going to be worth this. How many of those appliances did you install? Therefore, let's we'll adjust that way. And so there's a big concern that you're taking, you know, a metered value that you know with certainty, and then you're adjusting it with something that's really kind of a swag or at least not measured the same way. And one of the best ways to address this issue is with the meter technology that's available. And, and so right now, IMI, INM doesn't have full AMI deployment, but some of their sister companies do. And with full deployment of AMI technology, it really does open up the opportunities to be more precise and more accurate in the measurement of these DSM savings, and that consistent measurement across all jurisdictions. And I know it's, it's a little bit because we're focused right now on Indiana, but, you know, INM is a multi-state utility. And where this is a real concern is you could have, you know, INM could offer the exact same program to two customers that live right on the other side of the state. They may even go to the same church, go to, they may work together, but because they live in different parts of the state and they're participating in different um, utility, it's the same utility, but because they're measured in different regulatory constructs, that those, that same program may get measured completely differently and be worth different amounts. And when you think about a utility like AP that operates, you know, in 11 different states, it starts to be very complex when you're trying to measure the impact of energy efficiency on the load forecast when you've got, you know, again, accurate measurements for all of the other aspects that go into the, the IRP with the exception of this one, and here we're kind of just, again, it's, it's not nearly as precise because it's not metered the way that all these other inputs are. So again, that's something I hope when we think about the future of this, I really firmly believe that if we had better measurement of the DSM savings, that we could really find a lot more common agreement going forward in terms of how to model this. Now, in terms of how to model DSM in a load forecast, um, you know, we, we uh, listened to a, uh, and participated in a group a presentation with uh, the Brattle Group. I think they did it with PJM several years back. And they had done a survey of, of, of utilities across the industry to ask them how are they modeling DSM in their sales forecast. And they basically found that there are roughly six approaches that are being done. Uh, the first one is where they just assume that the DSM that is embedded in your historical sales data and, and therefore, you make no post-regression adjustment. You're basically just assuming whatever happened in the past will continue going forward. Uh, there's another one where you reconstruct, uh, I'm sorry, the historical DSM is embedded in the sales, but you're going to adjust in the incremental because you recognize that what has happened in your historical data may not necessarily represent the changes in energy efficiency or at least the programs that you're going to be offering in the future. And so there you are you're actually making an adjustment to future DSM. Uh, the third option was where you go in and you reconstruct your historical sales as if no DSM had existed. You're basically adding everything back and then do a regression on, do a post-regression adjustment. And I think we may have heard a little bit of a discussion about an approach similar to that earlier today. Um, the next one is where you include DSM as a right-hand side explanatory variable in the econometric model. And I think you, you just heard Eric describe their approach, which I think is more similar to that approach. Um, although they do use the hybrid approach, which is number five that we've talked about earlier, the SAE statistically adjust end use approach. And that one again is, is very, um, it's very insightful because it embeds the end use features, but also combines it with the econometric models. And so you can get both the best of both worlds where you can still see what's happening by end use shapes, but you're also able to really capture what's happening in the economy and the projections going forward with with changes that would have, would we, that we would expect going forward. And then the, the last one is just a combination of those. 
And, and really for IM, we, we really are doing a combination approach. We, we definitely use the ITRON SAE model, so we start with number five, but we do make an adjustment to the DSM savings um, so that we can account for everything without double counting energy efficiency. And we call that the supplemental efficiency adjustment. So just to kind of a graphical representation of what the SAE model gets you, um, you know, this is just looking at INN's residential usage profile. And so you can, again, see over time and then in the forecast, the usage by uh, end use. And you heard Eric describe kind of the heating, the cooling. We, we strip out lighting as, as its own kind of an end use. And then you've got all the other appliances out there that, that are growing. And, and you can see how, for example, the, the lighting, the yellow bars, really have gotten much smaller over time. This is, again, a very similar graphic to what you saw in Eric's presentation. Uh, but, but this, again, allows you to look at the composition of your load profile by end use so that when you've got specific DSM programs that are targeting specific end uses, it's much easier to kind of really dive in and see the impacts or isolate the impacts on the load forecast. So in response, we're, we're currently in the middle of our IRP cycle for INM, and in response to some uh, feedback that we received from some of our stakeholders, we've started going around to peer utilities, both in the states of Indiana and Michigan, to kind of really get um, a little more familiar with how everybody else is modeling energy efficiency in their load forecast and, and within their IRP. Um, we, we did find that some of the, um, there was one, one stakeholder in particular that had made some uh, statements about what others were doing. And then when we went and kind of tried to validate that, we found that some of those may be slightly different. Uh, but I wanted to kind of just show you the results so far. And again, we're not through with this analysis yet. We're still in the process of interviewing other utilities. So if you are a utility in the states of Indiana or Michigan or anybody else, and we haven't contacted you yet, just know we're, we will be reaching out to you just so we can have this kind of discussion. But we, what we found is that there are, you know, there's, and I think you heard this said earlier, there's not just one way to model this. And I think that's very important to know that the, there are different ways to do this. And, and what's important is just that the, the approach that you use needs to be aligned with how you model your load forecast. Because again, trying to do a one size fit all, it just simply doesn't work. So some of the utilities we've talked to are using ITRON's SAE models. Some are just using a traditional econometric model. Um, but one of the other things that's real important is, uh, and, and the, the rules in Michigan are a little bit different, but some are op truly optimizing uh, the DSM programs along with all of the other resource options so that in your IRP, it shows you what is the optimal amount of DSM that should be selected. Whereas others are kind of really just starting with a target that's constant and their optimization is more along the line of well, what, how would our cost change if we did a little bit more or a little bit less, but essentially they're assuming that you would do the same level of savings in perpetuity throughout the, the entire forecast horizon. And so that's a little bit different than IM's. IM's approach, we are truly trying to optimize that. Uh, in terms of the, the DSM approach, again, of the ones we've talked to so far, two of them are using the DSM regression model, so they're treating it as a right-hand side variable. And basically, as Eric described, looking to that coefficient to determine how much they should be adjusting or discounting the uh, savings from DSM programs to subtract out of the load forecast so that you don't end up double counting. Uh, but there was one utility that is doing something a little bit more similar to us where they are looking at individual measure lives and letting, you know, whatever programs have already been approved by the commission we're gonna let those kind of finish out based on their measure life. And then after that, you assume no savings going forward. And you'll see when we get to our matrix, that's very similar to the approach that INM is using. And then finally, uh, you know, are the, are they adjusting DSM in the load forecast? And again, most of them are using that coefficient that they get from the right-hand side variable. Uh, but, you know, AP or, and INM are using this supplemental efficiency adjustment, which we'll talk a little bit more here uh, in just a couple of slides. Before we go to that, though, I do want to point out we did try the approach that Eric described, where you put DSM as a right hand side variable. And, you know, we just wanted to see how would that compare to our current approach. And unfortunately, 
for us in our, in our modeling, it did not prove to be statistically significant. And so you can see there the, the T-stats were really low and the P-values were really high. So this would not necessarily suggest that we, we need that. But again, we've got other variables that may be capturing um, other things. And so, you know, I'm not trying to say it's a one size fits all. I do think it was interesting though, when we listened to Eric's presentation about, you know, the coefficient he talked about, it was roughly, I think it was around 42% or something or 58% that was the, the actual coefficient. And so, you know, what we've developed is this, a, a, sorry, supplemental efficiency adjustment. And, and it's a matrix approach. And so what we end up doing is whatever, for every single year, we look at what are the incremental savings that are associated with that program for this year. And we ask how long is the expected measure life? And for this, we kind of group those into, you know, what's the end use going to be and, and, you know, kind of what's the measure life. Those are the big assumptions that we're making to, for modeling this. But what we're doing is basically from this matrix and based on their measure life, we're assuming, you know, that we're going to subtract the full amount of savings in year one, but over time as the, you know, market continues to get more and more efficient, we're going to subtract less and less of that from our load forecast because the load forecast itself, that ITRON model, already accounts for growing, increasing energy efficiency in the future. And so just kind of as a level set, so you can see how does INM's approach compare to what you just heard Eric describe for AES. And so for this example, we just looked at a lighting program that would be implemented in 2020 and it was roughly about 46%. So again, it's not exactly what AES is doing with their uh, statistical you know, coefficient. Our, you know, that model the approach did not work for us, but conceptually you're getting roughly the same, you're getting to the same point using this uh, matrix approach. And so the, the last point I wanted to kind of make here is, you know, from INM's perspective, we are using a consistent load forecast across multiple uses. And, and again, you know, some of the parts that we've heard today was the idea that for an IRP, you can use a different load forecast or maybe accuracy doesn't matter. And, and I'm not going to dispute whether that's true or not. But the concern or the risk that I see here is that if you have a load forecast that you're using for IRPs that is completely disjointed from the load forecast that you're going to come in and present in a base forecast or a rider forecast where you're going to be setting rates, there's a risk here that you're going to go out and say, look, we needed the separate forecast that's completely independent that said we needed all of these additional resources or all this additional investment, but yet when it comes in to actually seek recovery of that, we're going to assume that we're going to have a very different load profile to recover those costs. And so from our perspective, there's a lot of value in having those kind of in sync. Furthermore, our load forecast is the same one that's going to be used for our earnings projections with Wall Street. And so the same story that we're telling our regulators in terms of what we believe the future is, is the same story we're telling our investors. And, and again, I think there is some value there to making sure that those are all aligned and consistent so that you don't end up kind of tripping over yourself saying, well, over in this world, we want a higher load forecast, but over here we want a lower load forecast. I, I just think, you know, for consistency purposes, there is a lot of value in keeping those in sync. Now, the one difference that we, we will point out is when we're using, um, it, it's all about the long-term assumptions. So in the IRP, since we're going to let the IRP optimize the, the optimal levels of, of energy efficiency, we're only going to assume the impact of what's already been approved historically, as well as what the commission has currently approved. So anything that the commission has currently approved, we're going to assume all of those programs are going to work their way through and the impact of those programs will continue to uh, impact the load forecast going forward. But that's it. After that commission portfolio is approved, from there on, any future energy efficiency is going to be optimized in the IRP optimization. But when it comes to a financial forecast or, or those, what we're using for the long term is what did the previous IRP tell us the optimal DSM assumption should be in the long term. And so that's really the only key distinction. Uh, you know, I just get a little uncomfortable of trying to basically recreate history with a number that wasn't metered to begin with because you're getting further and further away from, in my world, the truth. And so let me, I think that's the gist of my presentation. So Dr. Bohr, maybe I should uh, pause there and just see if 
if you have any questions that have come in. Well, we have one question here is, is uh, um, asking you to expand on the idea of AMI measuring DSM more precisely. The DSM impact itself is not metered by AMI. So I am not sure I understand. Great question and thank you for that. So let me give you an example from PSO and that's our sister company in Oklahoma. So within their energy efficiency portfolio, one of the programs that they implemented was the volt bar optimization, VBO. And, you know, from their vendor, they had, you know, been told that it was going to achieve roughly 4% savings for every circuit that they installed this on. But with the, when we actually look at what's happening with the AMI data, you can see what the load profile was before the volt bar was installed and you can see what it was after. And we found that there are some circuits that where there are really old houses and they really haven't employed, uh, deployed much energy efficient technology where you can kind of get close to that 4%. But on the circuits where you have newer homes that had more uh, energy efficiency already installed, that the number was less than 2%. And so, you know, we've done another, there's another program that PSO does uh, with regards to um, in their energy efficiency portfolio with, with regards to Wi-Fi thermostats and the ability to go in and, and to adjust the thermostat up in order to get a demand response. And again, AMI data is very powerful because you're not just kind of speculating how much did, you know, is the average customer, is this average program worth? You can actually look and see what did the customer's usage profile look like before they participated in this program and how did their pro usage profile change afterwards? And it really does help you validate what the true savings were. And, you know, that's one of the issues. And I know in the EMV process, they try to account for free riders and, and spill over those sorts of things. But, you know, it, it's really difficult to really capture all customers that may have, you know, participated in the program, got a new efficiency light bulb, but they installed it in a closet. And in reality, that closet was hardly ever used before, and it's hardly ever used now. So even though they participated, it didn't really create a metered savings that's going to adjust or impact the consumers and the utilities costs. And so that, that's where, from my perspective, using AMI data to really kind of look at what it was before and after is a way to really kind of validate how much savings you truly are getting from these programs. Let me throw it out to the other speakers to see if they have any questions. Oh, Anna, if you want to jump in, uh, Anna, and with your question. Um, sure. Um, thanks, Chad. I uh, wondered when you folks had attempted to use a right hand DSM variable in that example that you gave. Uh, we are actually, we just tried it here in the last two weeks, just you know, like kind of when we found out about this, but also as after we've been doing these interviews with some of the other companies, just seeing how they're doing it. Okay. And did you also attempt to do so in your commercial model? We haven't yet, but we certainly can. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Let me just ask a, uh, uh, a question on my end. Where does, for the uh, ITRON, the SAE model that they develop, I mean, that's based on um, EIA data, correct? So how often, yes, I mean, where does that EIA, EIA data come from? How often is it updated? And that's probably by census region. So then how, is that then modified using your survey data, if you have any, and and how? I guess how how uh, transparent is is all of that data in the process, uh, if it's going back to EIA data. Great questions. So yes, the SAE ITRON's SAE model is updated every year. There's an annual update that they publish after the annual energy update outlook from EIA is published. So, you know, it, it starts with the, the uh, EIA, and then once they've kind of published what their latest projections are and how things are projected to, you know, change 
ITRON will come in and update their data tables with that as well. And you're exactly right, they're done at the census regions. But then what a utility would do is come in and say, this is what it was for the census region, the East, North, Central, or, or East, South, Central, whichever region you're, you're projecting, for instance. And then you come in and you say, well, what about our own residential survey data? Because we, every three to four years, we're doing our own survey of our customers to find out what appliances they have, how old they are, how recently they've been, you know, replaced and with what technologies and those sorts of things. And so what we do is we'll take uh, the data from ITRON, which again started with EIA from the census, and for the ones that our surveys, you know, we, we've got more recent information and we can kind of see those trends over time, we'll kind of replace those with our own customer data or at least, you know, kind of match up with them. So we're still capturing what the trajectory is in the future, but really calibrating that to what our own customers' uh, adoption rates are that is specific for INN and territory. And that's a way to kind of, that's how we are able to keep it specific for our customers. Now, is that done, I, I assume that's, is that done by, for both the residential and the commercial model, or is it just the residential that you can really do that well? Right, yeah, so the, the commercial building surveys, as I think it was described earlier, are very expensive to do because there are so many different kinds of commercial buildings. You know, you've got little convenience stores that are in the commercial class along with mega hospitals and universities and those sorts of things. So they're, they're very different in terms of the usage profile, so it gets very expensive to do those. So for the commercial and industrial surveys, those, those are going to come from uh, EIA where they have the funding to be able to do that. But for a residential where the, you know, the usage patterns are typically more homogeneous, uh, you know, you're going to have single family, multifamily, or basically a manufactured home. For those, it's, it's more cost effective for a utility to kind of do their own surveys and, and calibrate that to, the, to their own. So for the commercial, we're, we're really relying on EIA, but for the residential, we are customizing that for our service territory. Yeah, Dr. Borm, this is Eric. I was going to mention, uh, we do the same thing. And uh, yeah, I mentioned the in-use analysis we're getting ready to conduct, conduct this summer as part of the market potential study. So that will inform our SAE data that goes into the load forecast. So we'll basically, we're going to survey and site visit both residential and commercial, commercial customers and basically count widgets and that sort of thing just to get an idea of efficiencies and saturations. And then that informs the the SAE data, there's, you know, like the base year, so it would be like 2021 or 2022, and then we would use the, the growth rate assumptions or efficiency and saturation assumptions provided by the EIA for future years, uh, but, but starting with our, our service territory as the base, base for that. Chad, let me ask you a real mundane question for our, uh, definitely our non technical uh, members of the of our uh, audience here. Um, on one of your slides, you referred to the P value. So can you say, uh, uh, can you define generally what a P value is? What is it indicative of? And generally kind of uh, what is a, uh, a threshold value? If you can yeah. about what's yeah. good or bad. That is, that is a great question, and uh, again, I will I will dumb it down because of that's easy for that comes real natural for me. But generally speaking, what um, a p value, which stands for the probability uh, value, and how that relates with the t stat. So you know what we're saying is, what's the statistically speaking? You know, are you can you be ninety five percent confident that this variable is is really explaining you know what it's supposed to be explaining in the model? And so when that variable has a probability value that's greater than say 0.05 or a T stat that's uh, less than 1.96, it generally doesn't, it, what it says is by adding this variable to the model, you really didn't gain any necessarily um, explanatory power. And the concern that you have to have, and we didn't mention this earlier, is by adding, by including variables that are not necessarily statistically significant, that could be correlated with other variables, you, you can create some multicollinearity. So if, if you think about it, within the SAE stream framework, we're already assuming energy efficiency is happening. And then when you throw on top of that 
utility sponsored DSM on top of that, if you're not careful, you could create a situation, especially if that variable is not statistically significant, where you could create some uh, multicollinearity issues. So that, uh, again, I hope that wasn't too technical and, uh, and also not too dumb, but that, that's basically how I'd give you the 40,000 view of that is you really want that to be significant in your model um, and in order for it to really be useful. Okay, I have a, a question from uh, Dan Mellinger, and um, he says that you mentioned that the market will eventually catch up with higher levels of efficiency. Um, how does this apply to measures that aren't based on equipment efficiency, such as weatherization? So, I may I may not understand the question exactly, but I think what what we would say is are you are you saying that we're going to be pushing programs that customers don't want anyway, and that's why that the market would never catch up with it? Because we saw something similar, I guess, with the CFL lighting. Like initially, customers said, "Hey, it sounds really cool to have less usage for lighting," but what our customer survey showed is that they hated that technology. And so as soon as a newer technology, the LED lights came out, they didn't necessarily replace the remaining incandescents with LEDs. They immediately replaced those CFLs with LEDs because they didn't like that technology. And so um, I guess, yeah, you know, again, I'd have to look at that more specifically what the question is asking. But if we're pushing technologies on our customers that they really don't like, I'm not sure how well that adoption rate would be anyway. Fred, I could attempt to clarify if Dan doesn't follow up. Oh, sure, go ahead, Anna. I mean, if, if he if he hasn't sent anything yet that I've seen, so it's okay. A delay. <laughs> um, well, uh, at the risk of attempting to speak for Dan, I think what he meant, Chad, is that um, there are measures that you guys are incentivizing that are not um, for, for which savings are not calculated based on a particular standard. And what you, what you were saying earlier in your presentation is that uh, you're just pushing the, you know, essentially the efficiency level of different measures um, uh, uh, upward in, a, in an accelerated trend compared to where it would be um, just under codes and standards. And, and so what he's asking is what about those measures for which there is no essentially a code and standard against which they're benchmarked? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would just say, you know, again, the, the market is going to is going to really be driven by what consumer preferences are, and I think to the extent that um, you, you know, energy efficiency is happening through, with and without standards, um, but it, it's all been driven by consumers and the technology that's being developed on those. So, you know, maybe there are some specific examples that we could walk through, but. I may still not be completely appreciating the question. Well, I mean, I think I think you're just illustrating the importance of energy efficiency programs because they they can induce market transformation. That's one of the the things that you know well developed and robust energy efficiency programs do. Um, so uh, maybe we're talking about things from the sort of opposite side of the spectrum. This is Brad. Um, I, let me ask a question real quickly here because I, I wasn't sure that there was going to be an answer there. If I'm if I'm wrong, then let me know. But uh, um, or you want to think about it some more. Uh, let me throw out another question here uh, um, for both you and Eric. Given that we know we're going to be wrong about projections for the future, um, and we really have to plan as if anything we're, we're projecting is going to be wrong. Um, how do you guys take into account uncertainty in your load forecasting? Um, and 
what are the, what are the uh, you know big considerations in, in how you uh, determine what is a uh, reasonable range of uh, uh, load forecast distributions? Eric, if you want, I can start. You know, all I can say is from our perspective, we appreciate that we know we're gonna be wrong, but that doesn't necessarily give us an out because our management, Wall Street, even our commissions, they they don't expect us to be that wrong. And so, you know, they, they expect us, if we are wrong, to be able to understand why we were wrong and to be able to explain that. Now, there are lots of things that will happen outside of our control um, that may force us to be wrong. For instance, uh, there are very few people two, <laughs> two years ago that were thinking, you know what, we probably are due for a pandemic. Let's just do that. And so there are certain things that you are going, you know you're going to be wrong at. But, you know, I think that's why it's really important to understand all of the inputs that go into a load forecast, including all the economic drivers, the demographics, you know, your, what's happening with your economic development, your energy efficiency. I mean, there's a whole host of inputs or influences both that have happened historically as, what's, as well as what's gonna happen in the future to think about. But specifically, we do a lot of scenarios within our IRP optimization. And you know, some of those are more stakeholder driven and some are just you know, practical planning measures. But you know, we, we do a whole host of scenarios. I think we end up doing about six or seven of those. And then what we would hand off to the IRP is, is really those extremes and kind of the, the middle of the road. Because, you know, I think it's important for a utilities planning perspective to make sure that their optimal portfolio that they choose can still re behave well and kind of give you a no regrets scenario under any of these outcomes. And so while you, can, you could labor the modeling process and do those for every single one, the reality is if you've got all these other scenarios that are within the outer bands, it's safe to say if the portfolio performed well at the extremes, it's also going to perform well in the middle. And so that's kind of how our approach is, is you know, our management expects that point forecast because they're gonna to have to give Wall Street an earnings estimate. But in reality, we also do uh, some scenarios around that uh, and, and really kind of stress the extremes on those to make sure that the resource mix that we select out of the IRP, it really is, um, it's resilient enough to be able to handle any of those outcomes. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Um, yeah, I mean, so our, my answer is going to be pretty similar. Uh, you know, so internally for load forecasting, for budgets and, and those sorts of things, you know, we put together scenarios. So, for example, like last year with COVID, when COVID happened in, in you know, April, May, uh, there was a scramble to put together scenarios of what recovery would look like from COVID. And so, you know, I think we had three at the time. So we had like an L-shaped recovery, which was a really slow recovery, a U-shaped recovery, which is more of a traditional, you know, recession type recovery. And then we put together a W, which assumed like a, a second wave or a second shutdown from COVID. And then, then we'd come back. So that's just an example. And like this year, you know, we're working through budgets now. And so we're looking at some, um, uh, distributed generation and EV uh, uh, scenarios uh, that assume, you know, quicker adoption, less adoption, um, that sort of thing. And that's that's internal. Um, you know, as far as for our IRP, so in 2019, you know, we used the PowerSim planning model. And with PowerSim, it, uh, it ran a stochastic analysis as part of the capacity expansion piece where, you know, I think I, I can't remember exactly how many simulations it ran, like 100 simulations somewhere in there. Uh, on load, um, so we had, you know, so we had a a, a distribution of load uh, that went into out into the into the future cone of uncertainty sort of thing um, that we used for the for the planning there. Um, so that's that, yeah, that's that's how we capture it as well. That uncertainty. Okay, I have another question here. Um, how does work from the home affect residential and commercial forecasting uh, in the future? Have we learned what the workplace of the future looks like post pandemic? I was gonna say that that's that's a, a big guess. We're we're still we're still trying to figure that one out. I'll tell you what we have started, we, what we have incorporated, which has been very informative. Um, so we started using Google mobility data 
uh, and inform that into, we have what's called the COVID shift variable. Uh, so similar to that DSM variable that I was showing, where we put uh, you know, a drop of variable in to capture DSM, you know, when COVID happened in April, May of last year, we put a, a, basically a binary variable in, a one for those months. And then every month after that, we, we adjust that variable. So say it's not gonna be quite as bad as COVID, maybe it'll be about 50% as bad as April and May of last year in uh, you know June or whatever. And so we're able to, to dial that around anywhere from between zero and one. And so we use that to to try to forecast the how the recovery from COVID that in addition to the economic data. Um, and so what we started doing was we started using Google mobility data to help track that. And so what that is, is in January of last year, Google basically established a baseline of, you know, where everyone's just acting normally and then COVID happens in uh, March and April. And they start tracking using, you know, basically cell phone data, how people are moving around. And so some of the key components are, are they visiting retailers, you know? So you're able to see the percentage of customers compared to the baseline that are going out and, and visiting retailers. And one of the key assumptions that Google has is a work workplace assumption. So are residential customers going to work? Um, so we use that, that Google mobility data to, to get a gauge on, you know, how customers are, are, are behaving and when, when they're going back to the office. Uh, I mean, I should say it gives you a snapshot in time, but it doesn't give you a forecast necessarily. So we're still, we're still trying, to, trying to determine that. And I, I don't think it's ever going to be like it was. You know, I think there's going to be some sort of hybrid, hybrid approach going forward of, you know, part working from home, part working in the office. Um, but anyway, that's that's how we do it. Yeah, Eric, the only thing I wanted to add to this, um, this is um, from a presentation the Census, um, or actually a study the Census Bureau did, I think in 2019, from 2018 data, that talked about the share of work from home jobs um, before the pandemic. Because, you know, across the industry, we all want to believe that our residential loads are going to be as high, the, the work from home and everybody that we saw the big increase in residential right as the pandemic began, we all want to believe that that's gonna stick. But the reality is that it really is a, a function of what is the economy that, that you specifically live within, because it's not gonna be a true for, for across the board. Those that have more office type jobs that are more suited for a work from home environment, those are more likely to have a stick than those that have a much higher industrial base. And so, again, I thought this was an interesting map and because we look at, you know, again, if you think about the AP service territory, it's largely a lot of those red states here, which mean that the percentage of jobs that are work from home prior to the pandemic is less than the rest of the country. And if you think about it, it does make sense, right? Like there are certain jobs you simply can't do from home. It's really hard to assemble an RV to drill for oil or to, uh, you know, melt steel in your basement. There are certain things you really have to be in a manufacturing facility to do. And so what our experience has been thus far, and we're certainly monitoring this because, again, we all want to believe that our residential load will be higher long term. It, it just kind of, you know, util that's where you see a lot of growth right now. But the reality is, as, as the economy's vaccinations have increased, and as the economies have opened up more and more, uh, that boost that we saw in residential is starting to wane. And conversely, as you would expect, the drag that we saw in commercial and industrial initially is really starting to dissipate as well. And so we, we're slowly reverting back to a normal. So the big question is how much of what happened here, that shock that happened from the pandemic is going to be sustainable long-term versus is you know, it's just going to take a while for us, but we'll eventually come back to a new normal. And so I don't think it will necessarily be exactly what it was before, but I think because of our service territory, specifically having a lot more manufacturing and a lot more jobs where that just aren't suited for doing from home, that we may not see the same kind of permanent shift that you will see in some of the more um, urban centers or out further west or, or even on the coastal lines. Again, this is just based on the American Community Survey. Sorry for bringing up something that wasn't in the materials, but since this question went there, I, I thought I would share. 
Oh, that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I right now I'm not seeing any other questions, so um, I think we're we're running about 20 minutes. I think ahead of schedule. But Anna, are you ready to uh, uh, jump in and and uh, do your part now? And and then uh, if anything, we can uh, have more questions for everybody after yours. Or uh, and again, I'm not. Uh, opposed to this ending early either. So that's the beauty of this is it can end early and, and we're already in our offices so we can turn <laughs> around and do other things. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm ready to go, except that I don't have sharing enabled on my side. Brad, I don't know if you need to do that. You should be enabled. We have her presentation in case I need to pull it up. Um, I wonder uh -huh. if I need to close out of WebEx again and then restart. Do we want to take like maybe a, a five minute break or so? Well, sure. I, I figure this out. We can do that. Okay. So come back at 255? Yes. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks. That'll give me.
Hey, Anna, we can see your uh, your slides. So okay, great. It is working. Okay, good. So we'll just we'll just give it another minute here, and then we'll start up. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Well, I think we're one minute past what you said we would. So, um, I mean, if you're ready to go, Anna, let's All do right. this. And like I said, if we get done early, then uh, um, I'm not definitely not opposed to that. <laughs> um, I suspect that we will. I don't have that many slides. Um, uh, you know, first of all, thank you. Brad and Bob for organizing this session and um, to the rest of the commissioners and the commission staff for um, encouraging and, and participating in this um, workshop. Um, I've had the opportunity to participate in a number of uh, uh, contemporary issues conferences over the past few years and have found many of them to be um, illuminating and informative. Um, so I appreciate that we're we've been given an opportunity to speak on this important issue as well. Um, uh, I suspect that there are a number of folks who do not know who Energy Futures Group is, and um, so I just thought I'd take a moment to introduce um, myself and Chelsea Hotelling, who's going to be tag, tag, tag teaming this presentation with me. Um, we are, we're a small consulting company. Um, uh, Chelsea and I um, work together on uh, integrated resource planning topics and modeling across a wide range of jurisdictions. We both critically review integrated resource plans and perform our own IRP modeling. Um, we've worked in that capacity uh, for over a decade now in Indiana and um, uh, load forecasts and how they relate to energy efficiency is certainly an issue that we spend a lot of time thinking about um, across multiple jurisdictions. Um, I wanted to emphasize, because I think there's been some misunderstanding um, in the past when we've talked about this issue that we do think that it's important to account for energy efficiency in a load forecast. Um, you, if you want to model energy efficiency as an explicit resource in an IRP, then you must adjust for um, the historic impacts of energy efficiency in your load forecast. And the question is how you do that. Um, utilities that we've encountered you know, across multiple jurisdictions and over 100 IRPs um, adjust their load forecasts for energy efficiency uh, within the load forecast itself, as opposed to adjusting for um, historic energy efficiency savings um, in the energy efficiency bundles or the energy efficiency resource. And that is, the, to, to my mind, the main way in which um, the two uh, approaches that we just heard discussed from AES and INM differ. So AES is, is adjusting for um, uh, you know, historic and persisting impacts of energy efficiency through um, various analytical adjustments to its, its load forecast. And INM makes very modest adjustments to its load forecast, and the vast majority of its adjustment happens on the energy efficiency resource side, on the bundles of energy efficiency that are modeled in an IRP. And that is uh, what distinguishes it, not just from AS, but from all other utilities of which we, we are aware. Um, uh, and that, that has some important um, negative consequences for the selection of energy efficiency. And so that's what we're going to focus on today, um, because I think this is a, an area where significant improvement could be made. Um, I mentioned earlier that Chelsea Hotelling, who works with me at EFG, is going to also do a couple slides um, in this presentation. I asked her to do that because uh, she's had uh, 
you know, series of formal uh, load forecasting trainings with ITRON, which is the vendor of the load forecast model that many Indiana utilities use. Um, and she's reviewed you know, dozens of utility load forecasts herself. Um, you won't see her video because we both live in a rural area and Chelsea lives in a particular, particularly rural area. So internet service is not as great where she's located, um, but you should be able to, to hear her voice. Um, so with that, I'll just ask her uh, to take it away. Thanks, Anna. And again, apologies for not being on video. Um, I would I would get lost if I tried to turn it on. So my apologies <laughs> for that. Um, and thanks, Anna. So if you want to start, okay. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to talk about is um, some recommendations that ITRON had published in a paper. Um, and they, they made three recommendations or methods um, to utilities that are using their statistical adjusted end use model or SAE model um, to create their load forecasts. And this slide con contains some um, further detail if you want to look at each um, individual method, but I just kind of want to highlight how each one is different. So the, the first method is called the add back method. And basically the idea of this is that you reconstitute your historical load um, by adding in the, the impact of his, of past DSM program. So basically what you're saying is, what would our energy consumption have been um, if the utility had not done any of their specific DSM programs? And um, the idea behind this is that you will, you will be able to develop a true no DSM forecast that you can then make adjustments to um, based on past and any future planned um, DSM programs. So with this, you're really looking at adjusting the left-hand side of the equation um, and modifying the, the sales forecast that you're looking at. Um, on the other hand, method two, which is the DSM variable method, um, which you heard Eric um, talk about, is looking at um, adding uh, DSM as a right-hand side variable. So instead of being on the left-hand side, we're focusing on the right-hand side. Um, and the idea is that you use this variable to look at the cumulative impact of um, past programs for DSM. So you can use that coefficient to determine the percent of savings that are captured by other variables. Um, so then you so then you can then back into um, the percentage of savings that are not captured and that need to be included in the forecast. And this is what Eric had highlighted in his presentation. And the third method is called the DSM trend method. And so this is different from the first two methods in that the first two really focused on adjusting DSM out of the forecast. And on the other hand, this is saying, um, we recognize that there's you know, historical DSM and DSM trends that are embedded in your um, actual sales da data. And so the idea is that you assume that the levels and the trends for those um, DSM savings that are in the historical data continue um, at approximately the same rate. And then what you can do is, is you can adjust the forecast if the DSM impacts are expected to be either higher or lower um, than what the historical trends um, are, are forecasted to be. Um, and just to note that INM does not use um, any of these methodologies. And so um, we would recommend, given the feedback we've heard from Chad, that method two is does not seem to be um, a viable option for INM to use that um, method one or the add back method uh, be considered um, for the load forecast for IRP planning. And um, I'm going to go into a little more detail on the add back method on the next slide. So this graph um, is from the ITRON report on the, the three recommended methodologies. And so this is the method one add back. And this is an illustration to show um, how this would work. And you can see that this the red solid line is showing you what the historical load was um, before any DSM. So this is before the utility even started offering any DSM programs. And then you can see that there's a, a black line labeled DSM begins that starts the point where utility is starting to um, implement DSM programs. So now you can see that that red line then diverges into two. There's a dotted red line and a solid red line. Um, so the solid red line is showing you um, what the historical measured loads um, were with that DSM added back back into it. And the red line is showing you what was measured or um, what happened when you consider the impact of, of DSM on, on load. And so what happens is, is when you add that, that DSM, those DSM savings back in, um, you then can see from the model, it will result in this um, blue dash line, which shows you the forecast with no DSM savings. And so the idea um, with this method is that, you know, you can then adjust that line downwards based on what the, um, 
what you have for planned DSM programs. And so that would be the shift down from the dotted blue line to the solid blue line. And then if you have any future DSM programs, you can then um, consider that those impacts, and then you would move from the solid blue line to the dark green line uh, for your forecast period. And so I would just highlight, as Anna mentioned, um, i and had said that this the supplemental adjustment um, is one of their you know, combination methods to use to model energy efficiency. Um, but in all of the IRPs, as Anna mentioned, that we have reviewed, we haven't seen any other utility um, take the approach of adjusting their forecast and adjusting um, how energy efficiency is modeled on the su supply side basis. Um, and so that's why we would recommend um, that i &M look at trying this method um, to adjust for the DSM impacts on the load forecast. So I'd turn it back over to you, Anna. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, I want to talk about a few of the implications of uh, i &M's use of its supplemental efficiency adjustment. Um, but first, I want to talk about uh, what that adjustment actually is and actually does. Um, during uh, during Chad's presentation, he gave he showed a table that gave a series of uh, savings, a time series of savings, I think, for residential lighting, if I recall correctly. And um, it showed, I think, a 15 year life. And it, and he said the total of that adjustment was uh, 46 percent. So the, that particular table is just a step in getting to the adjustment that INM actually applies to its load forecast. It's not what is applied to its load forecast. Um, the information that I'm showing here in this table is information that we received from INM um, in prior discovery responses. Um, and it shows the, the total actual adjustment that's being made to the load forecast. So um, this is looking backward because we were talking about a forecast period that began in 2019. So at this point in time, uh, the the load forecast um, uh, started in 2019 and went forward. Um, so sort of you just sort of think about this as um, you know illustrative of how this would play out um, for future forecast years too. Um, so the the total adjustment to the 2019 load forecast, and by adjustment I mean uh, INM runs its version of ITRON's SAE model. It produces a, a value, a sales output uh, for 2019, and then it actually subtracts this 83.8 gigawatt hours from that sales output. Um, so the the percentage, the, the, the 83.8 gigawatt hours as a percentage of total retail sales is about 0.47%. Um, the uh, adjustment only happens for three years uh, in this case, 2019, 2020, and 2021, uh, because essentially the way that the adjustment is calculated is that INM takes the difference between uh, savings in the forecast year and savings in the prior year, and then adds those together. And once those become negative, meaning that the sign changes, then it stops using this approach. So there's only three years in its load forecast that are actually adjusted under this methodology. Um, and one of the things that um, I think is uh, surprising or um, I guess uh, non-intuitive about this is that uh, INM is subtracting this adjustment from its load, load forecast rather than adding it back. So if I went back to um, the previous slide, uh, essentially what their model is producing is this line right here, because there's no DSM variable, you know, no, no mechanism within the load forecast itself to account for DSM. And then rather than adding in energy efficiency savings, INM is actually subtracting additional energy efficiency savings from this green line. And it's not clear why they why they are doing that. Um, one of the other impacts of this supplemental energy efficiency adjustment on the supply side, i.e. on how energy efficiency is modeled, um, is that um, Every bundle of energy efficiency is assigned either a 10 year or a 15 year life. So essentially, uh, INM says, okay, if we think this bundle of um, you know, commercial lighting measures has a 13 year life, it, we will now assign it a 15 year life and we'll spread those savings across this 15 year curve. Um, the, the curves themselves are not flat. They actually go downward such that by the end of the last year of the curve, 
um, the assumption is that there are zero savings associated with these bundles. Um, and we don't know what the basis for this is. Um, uh, we've never been presented with any sort of analytical basis for these assumptions. These are just the curves that INM says that it uses. Uh, uh, part of the sort of, you know, um, qualitative basis, if you will, that the INM has given. So we haven't seen a qualitative, a quantitative basis, but they've given a qualitative basis. P part of the qualitative basis that they've given is that uh, they need to do this to account for increasing codes and standards. Um, but these curves aren't actually aligned with how codes and standards are implemented, nor the manner in which they manifest. Because essentially what the curves are saying is that you have a new code, and, code or standard every year, and that's where your line decreases. And that those codes and standards are so effective that by the end of a measure's lifetime, uh, it pr that measure provides no additional savings beyond what the code and standard would mandate. Um, and this is not how codes and standards are actually implemented. It takes years to do so, um, nor is it uh, consistent with the, the impact that they actually have. Um, the other problem that this uh, creates is that uh, the level of energy efficiency savings in the load forecast is fixed. It, it, there is a you know, specific impact associated with energy efficiency savings uh, that's being captured in the load forecast. Um, and let's say, you know, to return to um, to the example that that um, that Chad and Eric talked about, let's say it's about 46 percent. Uh, that 46 percent, you know, translates into a specific number of gigawatt hours. And let's say in this case, uh, 20 gigawatt hours. The level of adjustment on the supply side to the energy efficiency bundles does not change regardless of the amount of energy efficiency that's contained in a plan. So if you have a you know, plan coming out of your IRP model that contains 100 gigawatt hours um, worth of efficiency, for example, approximately 50% of that is extracted from the actual bundles when you apply this methodology. Uh, so that 50 gigawatt hours obviously exceeds the 20 gigawatt hours that was in the load forecast. Um, the opposite can be true too. Uh, if the plan only contains 10 gigawatt hours and there's of energy efficiency and there's 20 gigawatt, gigawatt hours worth of future uh, DSM savings in the load forecast, uh, then the adjustment that's being made to the EE bundles is only five gigawatt hours um, less than what's actually contained in the load forecast. So there's no alignment here between what's being modeled in the energy efficiency bundles and what's being uh, actually represented in the in the load forecast, the energy efficiency savings that are actually represented in the load forecast. The other impact of this adjustment is that it um, distorts uh, energy efficiency savings and costs. So I mentioned before that um, because you have to assign either a 10 or a 15 year curve to all bundles, you are actually condensing or expanding the time period over which those savings happen. So in this example, um, these are these are measures that were modeled in INM's last IRP. Um, in this example, um, commercial lighting uh, originally started out with a 13-year measure life, uh, but because um, it has to be um, it, because it was assigned a 15-year um, life under the supplemental energy efficiency adjustment approach, those savings now go from 2020 out to 2033 or 14 years. Because recall, in the last year the 15th year of that period, those savings are zero. Um, similarly, the, um, there was a bundle called commercial miscellaneous um, that had a 16 year measure life. And that bundle was assigned a 15 year measure life also. So rather than those, those savings occurring over 16 years, they now occur over 15 years. Um, and again, just to reiterate, I know the savings will drop to zero across all bundles, regardless of the, the measure type or the time period that you're talking about. Um, the, the supplemental energy efficiency adjustment also uh, doubles energy efficiency cost. So INM, you know, has in the past correctly recognized that uh, if you are essentially taking away 50% of savings, you can't model the same cost associated with that because you'll be overstating cost. And so they attempt to degrade the cost along with the, the savings in the same, you know, 10 or 15 year shape. But the problem with that is that the cost of energy efficiency is incurred in the first year and not over the lifetime of those measures. And so there's no 
um, or it'd be very difficult to um, make those two consistent. And so the effect of the adjustment is that the cost of these bundles is actually doubled. The levelized cost is actually doubled. Um, the black bars on this right-hand graph indicate the levelized cost of these bundles coming out of the market potential study. This is the study that INM uh, produces to characterize the energy efficiency bundles that it will model in its IRP. And the, the gray shaded bars indicate the levelized cost that's actually modeled in the IRP after the adjustment. So you can think of the black bars as sort of pre-adjustment and the gray bars as post-adjustment. Um, and unfortunately, the effect of this adjustment is that it, it doubles um, cost of energy efficiency, which obviously makes it um, less amenable and less sort of desirable uh, for the IRP model to actually pick. Um, it's it's my you know strong belief that the proof is in the pudding here in terms of the um, the negative consequences of this approach on energy efficiency. Um, this graph shows the 2020 incremental savings as a percentage of el eligible sales across the five Indian IOUs. Um, when I prepared this presentation, I did not have the value for NIPSCO, so I put in the 2022 value, and I was uh, informed after. We sent this presentation and actually the 2021 approved plan value was very similar. It was still about 1.7%. Um, so INM, INM's approved plan savings for 2021 are dramatically smaller than those of the other Indiana IOUs. And um, I think this is a re re direct result of the use of the supplemental efficiency adjustment because the manner in which energy efficiency is modeled in the IRP dictates how much is selected and that level of savings is used as sort of the level to be implemented in the three-year DSM plan. So there's a direct connection here between um, the, the problems with modeling energy efficiency and representing energy efficiency under this approach and the lack of energy efficiency that's being offered in INM's DSM plan. Um, so that's all I wanted to, to talk about today. Um, and oh, actually, I do want to mention one other thing that's not in my presentation. Um, uh, we made a recommendation, or Chelsea made a recommendation in the second slide about using a different approach for INM's load forecast. And there's no reason that that approach can't be used across all of the the use cases for load forecast that INM has. In fact, um, it would be our feeling that. Uh, that would actually increase the accuracy of the load forecast. And we agree that you want to use the same one across these different use cases. Um, but it's particularly important that we get this right so the energy efficiency uh, can be modeled correctly in the IRPs. Um, so with that, um, thanks very much, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, uh, Bob, this is Mark Lewis with i and uh, I'm, I'm tempted to ask Anna about her analysis of Lawrence Berkeley, which was the topic of the presentation on the agenda. But instead, can I ask Chad of a couple questions? And uh, particularly, Chad, you, you've, you've seen Anna's presentation, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if what INM is doing is different from other utilities or similar to other utilities. And I'm also wondering, has this uh, argument been made to the commission and did the commission express an opinion about it? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, no, there there are several inaccuracies in this presentation. The way it was described is not at all what we do. And in fact, we, we described what we do and would be welcome to talk to anybody about that. Uh, but you know, in far, as far as what we're doing, the ultimate effect, and we, you just saw this earlier with Eric's presentation and our presentation, the, the net effect is almost exactly the same. And so we, again, we've tried the approach that Eric and others are using. We're still looking at what other utilities are doing, but what we found is that at the end of the day, what we're doing is very consistent with what others are doing. Um, and furthermore, and again, I would really encourage everybody to go out and look at um, the docket for case number 45285, which was our most recent DSM filing. This was a chance where the CAC uh, and Anna made all of these arguments in that arena. We rebutted those arguments, and the commission came out and a little bit. Yeah, um, Chad. 
Hey, this this is Brad. Um, let me jump in here and just say, I, mean, I don't want to get into a cat fight here, but I would, I I do think it's it would be useful to, uh, you know, I um, and M is starting to do some of that, looking at other utilities a little bit. I mean, it would be helpful to have more of that, uh, you know, uh, fleshed out at some point, and and. Uh, presented a little more uh, specificity and detail. Um, I know I, I can't help but think at times there's something here in terms of just the difference in terminology and wording and phrasing of stuff where lots of times if there, there, there isn't stuff there that's uh, also getting in the way of, of, of everyone understanding what everyone else is saying or thinking. So, I mean, I, I just throw that out there because um, uh, this, I mean, th th this is a conversation I would love to put to rest somehow. Uh, and I, I think the only way we're going to do that is to really just get down and really have a thorough analysis to understand where is it terminology, where is it actually something uh, substantive in terms of how people are looking at it or thinking about something or measuring it. Um, I guess I'll I'll just leave it at there for the time being. Um, so let me ask, do we have, I mean, do, I don't want to shut down the conversation in terms of people asking questions or anything, but I, like I, said, I also just don't want to get into a fight where we're just going over the same ground, not going anywhere um, uh, for another half hour or something like that. I really would like to uh, get to the nub of this debate uh, because I do think it would facilitate the resource planning discussions and stakeholder meetings and um, uh, and goodness knows it probably help in the hearing room uh, at some point. Perhaps what we can do and and is uh, um, in one way or another, just sit down and just have a really long day of face to face conversations and just wade through all of this stuff if we can, um, a smaller group of people. I just throw that out there as something we may want to think about. It sounds like a big uh, commitment of time and effort, but sometimes that's what it takes to actually make something more efficient and just be able to uh, say we know where we agree and we, we know where we disagree and, and we understand the implications of it and then we can move on. So Yeah, and, and Brad, this is Mark Lewis again. I, I, I agree with you and uh, we're, we're happy to participate in that conversation and and drill down into this. As Chad points out, a lot of this was discussed in our last DSM case. So if, if you're looking for, if the audience is looking for a place to start with understanding that, they can look at the uh, the testimony in that case and the commission's order, which found it to be reasonable, uh, which found what IMM was doing to be reasonable. So that might be one place to start. But we're happy to have that conversation. Hey, I'm sorry there when I, was talking earlier and I did not turn on my video. I'm a good example of I can only do so many things at once and uh, and uh, trying to click twice and then talk and think is, you know, boy, I'm just beyond my capabilities there. So, um, but let me see if there's any other questions or comments that people have. Cause I mean, there there is much to be discussed here and learned. I just, I'm just trying to think of uh, the best vehicle to do that. And I, I think it's just getting everybody either literally or figuratively in a room and just doing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the risk of speaking for CAC, I, I, I would be open to that too. Um, I think uh, uh, it's really difficult to do that on paper and that there were definitely concerns that weren't addressed um, in the DSM case. So. Um, being able to do that with actual numbers, I think, would be extraordinarily helpful. Do I have uh, any comments or, or questions 
uh, from anybody on on anything that we've just talked about uh, so far today? Because let me throw. I mean, I think I think the conversation that we've had so far about the starting off with the basics of the load forecast and and the different ways of doing it, the different uses, and and the especially my thing, the uncertainty of aspects of it are really useful and extremely important and uh, really, really go to the, I mean, as we all know, it starts, it's the starting block for doing the resource planning piece. And, uh, um, and, I, and as I said earlier in our next sessions, and I'll get this right this time, July 15th and August 19th, we will be building on this to, uh, 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 especially by bringing in the, you know, the discussion of the uh, market potential study and how to, if that, how that should be done uh, with the, in the load, taking into account the load forecast and then, then how you use that information there and tie it into the, uh, essentially the uh, energy efficiency supply curve. So, uh, I do want to thank all of the speakers for that, especially Tom and uh, Natalie for uh, uh, kicking this off for us. Is there uh, anything else? Uh, we do have, a, I guess, a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, no, can you just... Sorry, I think a couple of questions have come in, but as I've said, we've had technology problems. I would love to have a, a IRP uh, workshop without technical problems. I, I I don't think, I think the only time I didn't experience IRP workshop technical problems was when I uh, had to be, had to miss that day for uh, family issues. So other than that, I think I've always had technical issues to deal with. <laughs> All right, I think I have some questions here. Actually, these I think are for Tom. Are you still with us? Uh, Tom, you're still there, but the question I'm, is ready. I'm okay. still here. Hey, and you're awake too, good. Yeah. So we succeeded at least in some extent. I'm, uh, I'm ready for my lunch now, Brad. Uh, well, yeah, I, I bet. How in your experience in the Northwest Power Council, have you dealt with embedded EE, naturally occurring EE, and other adjustments the utilities in Indiana make to their load forecast. So I think what that's get, I mean, interpret that as you want. My interpretation is, are in, from what you've seen and heard, are, are Indiana utilities somehow doing things differently in general uh, the, than what you've seen in the Northwest? Well, the, the short answer is yes, they're doing things differently. Uh, and that's mostly a function of, um, the number of end uses covered in the SAE model versus the number of end uses covered in uh, other end use econometric models that, that are used here, which have a uh, greater, um, greater number of end uses. So in the SAE model, Itron's SAE model, you have heating and cooling and other, and other is largely derived econometrically. So it's, it's really what's on the wheel uh, of uh, uh, a lot of the adjustments in other end use econometric models. You have additional end uses in, in addition to heating and cooling. You have refrigeration, freezing, cooking, uh, lighting, uh, uh, dishwashers, 
clothes washers, dryers, um, you know, maybe as many as 10 to 15 different end uses. And each one of those can be explicitly calibrated with a baseline assumption given data that you might, you might get from a customer characteristics survey and metering information or other econometric means through uh, multiple you know, conditional demand approaches. And so you can make estimates of those end uses, which would reflect, if you know what their current consumption is, all the historical impacts. So you don't have to make those adjustments for historical impacts if you start with the current baseline assumption that they're using so many kilowatt hours a year for water heating to begin with, because that's that reflects everything up to date. And so on a going forward basis, both your potential assessment and your load forecast start with that same, as I said in that example, 3,600 kilowatt hours of electricity for water heating. Uh, that's not separately forecast through some econometric uh, uh, coefficient or through some adjustment to uh, reflect prior demand um, efficient uh, demand uh, and use efficiency. So you, you you now know where you both start from the load forecast and from the efficiency potential assessment. So you don't have to have a term that makes that other adjustment, uh, makes adjustments for those other end uses. With the SAE model, you've got to have a term that makes that adjustment somehow to reflect that you're not calibrating at that level of detail. And so, you know, you're left with some uncertainty about even though you've captured how much of the historical program experience uh, needs to uh, be accounted for in the future of the forecast, because you're forecasting that particular component forward uh, as a separate amount, you don't know which end uses it came from and whether those are the same end uses you're going to approach uh, with your programs going forward. You just know that there's a 50% write down or 20% write down based on prior program uh, experience and impact on loads. So there's, that, that creates this uncertainty about the crosswalk between load, your load forecast assumptions, what's underlying those, and going forward, even more importantly, the load shape of those uh, uh, loads on your system. As if, you, if you're really changing load shape, you're changing when your capacity problem is, you're changing when your energies need to be, energy needs to be available. And as we get more and more variable resources on the system, load shape matters even more and more with respect to reliability and whether you need storage of one type or another. So it's, you know, this, uh, the tools we have dictate the problem statement. And the, the, the more in use granularity you have, the less residual that's unaccounted for by your by the explicit uh, identification in the load forecast. So that's, that's really that in the Northwest, we have a lot more detail and so there still has to be an other, uh, because it's not specifically, you know, miscellaneous category still gets forecast as an econometric part of a com component, but it's a much smaller part of the total simply because we've enumerated what the other ones are with the SAE forecast uh, that ITRON has. Now it can do more, but right now it's set up to do heating and cooling and, and other. And so you left with this big component of other that gets uh, adjusted uh, with the demand side uh, coefficients or other other mechanisms that that they recommend okay um, and then there's another question also uh, can you speak to the role of market transformation in the pacific northwest sure it's one of the mechanisms that's used to capture energy efficiency going forward um, and so it it's a it's one of the light codes and standards and programs is one of the mechanics, uh, one of the tools that are that are used. Uh, it too has this, you know, forward looking kind of prognosis about what it anticipates doing. But it, again, the basis of the market transformation savings get updated uh, based on uh, each uh, iteration of a plan where where the a new plan says, now your new baseline for dishwashers is not that it, uh, we've improved on those through your programs. And let's start from uh, a new starting point. So the baseline for market transformation, the baselines for programs, all are identical. They may track them differently for their own program reporting purposes, but in terms of what gets counted against uh, uh, a plant, a regional target for energy efficiency, then the, the, the baseline is always the same. But it's a, it's another tool in the toolkit of getting to the savings.
Let's see, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So um, unless something suddenly comes in, I mean, I'd like to, I definitely want to thank all of the speakers uh, for their uh, contributions today. Um, and emphasize that this is hopefully just the, the foundation for the next two sessions, which will be helpful. Um, and uh, and get us into a conversation that that I think would be helpful because it not much when we do the IRPs workshops and the stakeholder sessions, um, and even when we get into the hearing room, for example, to throw out there that out there, not a whole lot of time is even spent even thinking about the market potential study, um, and it's been referenced very little other than saying. Here it is, you know, here's the technical potential, here's the economic potential, uh, and uh, that kind of stuff. But it's really not gone into in terms of how it ties back to what's, uh, how you do the load forecast and then how you use that information to put together your EE supply curve and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this will be uh, a, uh, open up a whole new conversation for everybody. Um, and that's not really a criticism here in Indiana so much as it's the fact that they're just, this is such a huge area of resource planning. Things are changing so fast that it's hard to really address all the different topics that need to be addressed. So um, I think this, working with the LBNL people here, we have a great opportunity to, uh, to uh, take a new look at some things that have been sitting there all along and, and we just haven't gotten to. So with that, I think we will close it out. Oh, and, and by the way, if you, well, let me do one last thing. If you do have questions, anybody has a question, you can send them to me or Bob Pauley, and uh, we will uh, uh, make sure that the uh, relevant speaker gets the question and uh, hopefully we'll be able to prepare a response. And then we will post any of those questions and responses to our website so that everybody can see them. Um, I know we've offered to do that in the past, and I don't think it's, we've had too many people take us up on that. So, uh, but uh, there's always a first. So we'll see what happens this time. Um, having said that, again, just feel free to shoot us questions if if something comes up and and. Uh, and you have a little bit more time to think about how you want to phrase the question. So uh, if there's nothing else, I would like to say thank you and, and uh, see you in a few weeks. Thanks, Bob. Brad. Thank Thanks, Brad.